welcome to all of you who are joining us from all over the world. We're almost a thousand of us here today. Good evening and good morning. I am Anla Cheng, founder and chair of the China Project. It's been an absolutely eventful year for US-China relations to say the least. And also for us here at the China Project where we have rebranded from the former SubChina. After founding and leading the China Project for the past six years, I have decided to transition from CEO to chair. And I will be introducing you to our new CEO, Bob Guterma, who was our previous CEO and who was building our business effort to great success. As executive chair, I will continue to play an active role, but in short, if you have any issues or problems with the China Project, please contact Bob. If you have any praise for us, please contact me. <laughs> the business of China has become quite sensitive and precarious, as you all know. Earlier this year, the Cyber Administration of China attacked the China Project for being agents of the US government intent on destabilizing China. Only a couple weeks ago, we were accused of being unregistered agents of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. Thanks to our great team and to you, our Sterling community, who came to our aid through Twitter and otherwise, we were able to refute all allegations. The issue appears to be behind us for now, but you can be assured that we continue to adhere to our slogan of shedding light, not heat, and reporting without fear or favor. There is much to discuss tonight. Our keynote is the legendary Stephen Roach, who unfortunately had a, a minor head accident and Stephen has insisted to be the keynote today despite that. And therefore he is wearing a sporty hat. Thank you for your un unwavering support, Stephen. And finally, thank you to all our sponsors, speakers, and to all of you, our strong community for making our annual Next China Conference possible. And now let me bring Bob onto the stage, our new CEO. Bob. All right. All right. I am excited to be speaking with you tonight for the first time as CEO and for the first time under the banner of the China Project. Um, this is our first big conference since the, the uh, name change. And as Anla referred to, between our internal company changes and the events taking place out there in the world, it would be an understatement to say that it has been a busy year in our world and in the China watching world in general. Taking over from Anla, if one can even call it that, is no easy task. This company, our network of subscribers, sponsors, supporters, and partners, and the incredible team that we've brought together over the years exists in overwhelmingly large part due to her vision and determination. It's a tough act to follow, um, but follow it we must, and, and I'm excited to be, uh, to be doing that. As a young company, we've relied on investment capital alongside our operating revenue to build our platform. Uh, we have a solid plan to become profitable by the end of 2024. And I wanna tell you about it very briefly before we segue into the content. Many of you have been readers, listeners, or otherwise followers for many years now. And I want you to know about the changes taking place so that you can help us because we want to become profitable and self-sustaining so that we can keep doing what we're doing uh, for the long run without being dependent on anyone else. There are two big changes underway in the China project that I want you to have in your minds when you think about us in the future. The first is that we're gonna be shifting from a B2C model to a B2B model. We started off as a free newsletter and then a paid Substack newsletter that primarily catered to current and former China expats, China wonks as we call them and the like. As we expanded our reach, our subscriber numbers grew, but never enough to become a fully uh, self-sustaining B2C subscriber model, a la the New York Times or most other media companies that you would think of. It turns out the general public, while interested in China, simply isn't willing to pay for specialized information uh, about the country or its society or culture or economy. At the same time, we learned that large and medium-sized corporations, government institutions, universities, nonprofits, think tanks, or really any other medium to large organization uh, was willing to pay for specialized information services. 
And so we're going to lean into that essentially. And this does not mean that we're going to be leaning out of the products and experiences and subscriptions and um, otherwise, uh, you know, content that we've been doing for individual subscribers over the year. Quite the contrary, we'll be growing all aspects of our platform. What it does mean is that we're going to be dedicating more time and resources to selling into organizations and creating information and data products that deliver more value to the people who are willing to pay for it. And that brings me to my second big change in our operations that I want you to have in your minds is that in addition to our news products and our analysis, we've been developing uh, database products and information services that go beyond the news. We have China Newsbase, which is a proprietary in-house archive of more than 80,000 news articles, reports, social media posts, and other digital records from the Chinese and English internet that we have tagged, filtered, and made searchable along various different uh, criteria. Think of it as an incredible time saver for anyone doing research on anything related to China. It started as an internal tool to make our jobs easier, and then we realized it would have a lot of value to the outside world. The second tool is the China Edge database, an interactive repository of ownership data, key executives, subsidiary and parent company relationships, news trackers, and other data points on more than 1,000 private, public, and state-owned companies in China. Bottom line, if you're an individual subscriber that works at a company that could or should know more about China, please reach out to us so that we can set up a discussion with you or someone in your organization. These subscriptions and partnerships are what are going to make us self-sustaining for the long run. And now before I hand it off to Jeremy Goldcorn, our editor-in-chief and MC for the evening, I want to mention our sponsors and partners for tonight, without whom a lot of what we do would not be possible. I'm going to just say their names and all the information is available at nextchinaconference.com where you can learn more about them, the speakers, or us as a company. Dorsey, a global law firm, High 2 Global, a global investment firm, Deloitte, Pillsbury, Kingdon Capital, KCY Family Office, Corker and Real Estate, L. Caterton, Markham Asia, Arcadia Management, and Tiffany & Co. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand off to Jeremy. Good evening, good morning, good day, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, as uh, Bob and Anla have uh, mentioned, it's been an interesting month, um, but we're gonna have fun and do, uh, do some really uh, interesting discussions tonight. And I am absolutely delighted to introduce our keynote speaker tonight, who is also our honorary tomorrow night, Stephen Roach, former chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia and chief economist. He is currently senior fellow at Paul Tsai China Center of the Yale Law School. He has long been one of Wall Street's most influential economists. In his keynote, Stephen will be discussing some of the ideas in his upcoming book, Accidental Conflicts, America, China, and the Clash of False Narratives, which is being released this month. Stephen has a rare combination of experience and thought leadership on Wall Street and in academia. Uh, and he's a leading uh, practitioner of analytical macroeconomics. He spent 30 years at Morgan Stanley, mainly as the firm's chief economist and eventually as the Hong Kong based chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia. Uh, he joined the Yale faculty in 2010 and has been teaching popular courses on Asia ever since then. And we're very lucky to have him join us tonight. Uh, uh, despite his he head injury, he graciously agreed to continue on, but with a hat. So Stephen, um, please turn on your camera, over to you. Thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Jeremy. Uh, and thank you to the China Project for your uh, invitation to uh, speak uh, this evening. Um, and I would uh, tip my hat to Anla, but you would not want to see what is underneath the hat uh, right now. Um, I, I'd like to focus my remarks um, on the big elephant uh, in the room in this uh, conference, the U.S.-China relationship, uh, and the book that I have uh, written that is about to be published about the relationship. 
needless to say, uh, this is a relationship that is probably the most important relationship in the world, but one that is in serious uh, trouble. Uh, in the past five years, we've gone from a trade war to a tech war to a new Cold War. Uh, and um, uh, it's, it's really a, um, an escalation of conflict that is without uh, uh, precedent. The core thesis that I develop uh, in this book is that this escalation of conflict would not have happened had it not been for the false narratives that both nations uh, have embraced toward each other. Uh, and I look at these false narratives in the context of a troubled relationship between two partner nations, both of whom are at blame and both of whom hold the key to resolving uh, uh, this conflict. And I wanna just share a few slides with you if I might. Okay, so yeah, this is the fancy cover of uh, the, the book, and it's a book that's broken down into four parts. Um, the first one focuses on the genesis of this uh, relationship conflict, and then the bulk of the book, uh, four chapters in parts uh, two, and again in part three, go through in great detail. Uh, America's false narratives of China, and then China's false narratives uh, in, um, in the United States. And just some examples of these false narratives uh, that I will list out and not go into because I want to really focus on the final part of the book, uh, my plan for conflict resolution. Uh, but for example, America's fixation on uh, a very large bilateral uh, trade deficit uh, with China as being uh, the source of all uh, uh, external pressure on American families. And yet uh, we all know that um, trade deficits don't happen in a vacuum for saving short countries like the United States who actually ran 102 uh, uh, bilateral trade deficits uh, with uh, other nations uh, uh, last year. America's fixation on Huawei as the arch enemy, when in fact we have dropped the ball on many of the building blocks uh, of our own uh, innovation, uh, such as R&D and STEM-based um, uh, focus in higher education. And at the same time, you know, China blaming... Uh, uh, U.S. containment on its own inability or unwillingness to rebalance its economy, uh, and China uh, launching a big global power play uh, prematurely, in my view, but based on a declinist view of uh, of, of America. All of these false narratives, and again, I detail them in the bulk of the book. Uh, have one important thing in common, and that is that they are politically expedient cover for the vulnerabilities of two uh, uh, nations who are not as confident uh, as their bluster might lead you to believe. And the interplay of these false narratives amplified by social media, which I go into in great detail in the book, uh, has become the high octane fuel of accidental conflict that could easily be ignited by any one of a number of sparks. Taiwan, the war in Ukraine, trade war, the tech war, uh, even global recession, which is, by the way, my base case for 2023. But my focus um, in the remaining five or six minutes that I have is less on the details of the false narratives and mo more on the fourth part of the book, which contains um, uh, what I think is a promising plan for conflict uh, resolution. 
Um, and it's a three-part plan. And let me just briefly describe them uh, uh, using some of these slides. Uh, the first step is to restore uh, trust. Uh, the level of distrust between the United States and China is as high um, as uh, I can remember it, certainly in all the years I've been following uh, China. Uh, and the, the lack of trust is a vacuum that can be uh, filled by focusing on a lot of low-hanging fruit, like just reopening uh, consulates that have been closed, loosening visa restrictions between the two nations, restarting educational exchanges, um, relaxing the constraints on uh, NGOs. But there are some big issues um, that are much tougher, but ultimately far more important, climate change, global health, especially uh, uh, in this era of pandemics, and uh, cyber security. In all these big areas, there's been a notable and unfortunate uh, lack of progress. Uh, and it will take uh, courage on the part of leaders in both nations to make progress on these bigger issues. Uh, secondly, uh, is the need to um, uh, abandon what I think is a zero-sum focus on bilateral trade deficits. Um, the United States, for example, has a multilateral problem, yet we concoct these agreements with China. You can see this graph here of the, uh, the ill-fated phase one accord that thankfully has now expired. It accomplished nothing. Uh, the target was to increase expenditures by 200 billion over two years, and we missed the target itself by 200 uh, billion dollars. Rather than focus on zero sum bilateral trade, my second step is to really focus more on positive sum pro growth market op opening initiatives, uh, like a bilateral investment treaty, which we had made a good deal of progress on before. Uh, Donald Trump was elected. Uh, and a bilateral investment treaty is an excellent vehicle to arbitrage some of the, the tough structural issues that divide um, uh, our two countries, whether it's labor practices, uh, environmental standards, um, technology innovation, subsidies to state-owned enterprises. Uh, and, um, you know, there's an example in the bottom of how um, a structural arbitrage could work um, uh, in taking the forced technology transfer issue off the table. All you've got to do is um, uh, eliminate foreign ownership uh, caps. There would be no joint ventures. And without JVs, there'd be nothing to uh, transfer. Um, the final piece of the plan um, is the one that uh, I find particularly intriguing. Uh, and that is to um, really uh, focus on a new architecture of engagement. Uh, we used to have these strategic and economic dialogues, um, but of course they were canceled uh, by the Trump administration as well. Uh, and um, uh, you know now all we have are you know leader to leader uh, Zoom meetings. That, you know there's some discussion over having. Um, you know, a meeting um, on the sidelines uh, at the upcoming uh, G20 meeting, uh, we can do a much better job than that. So my proposal is for a new uh, permanent institution, uh, call, call it a U.S.-China Secretariat that's located in a neutral uh, venue, uh, uh, equally staffed by American and Chinese professionals and diplomats um, that have commingled functionality. They're not silos. Uh, and they work full time on all aspects of the relationship from economics and trade to and technology uh, to human rights, uh, health, cyber, uh, and um, um, you know, other um, uh, deep issues that are of mutual uh, importance. The Secretariat has uh, four functions to frame the relationship. You can see on the right, through developing collaborative research efforts, uh, a jointly developed uh, a database, a convening function to bring together 
uh, existing expertise to solve tough problems like, like COVID, for example, uh, an outreach function, and then a very important oversight and compliance function to uh, implement and monitor existing uh, and uh, new agreements with a transparent uh, conflict screening um, uh, effort would be the, sort of the first stop for resolving disputes that arise. So that's my plan. And again, it's a plan that um, stresses uh, what is a right now a, a very destructive relationship, uh, relationships that are in trouble, whether they're human relationships or relationships between um, nations require a relationship solution that must bring both partners to the table, not one imposing a solution on the other. It requires leadership from the top uh, and it requires leaders to be courageous uh, and risk-taking uh, in resolving this conflict before it is too late. So that's the book. You can um, order it if you want. Um, and uh, I would encourage you uh, to think long and hard about what it's going to take to fix a troubled relationship. So uh, thank you all very much. I look forward to seeing some of you uh, tomorrow um, at the dinner gala in Manhattan. And again, apologies for the hat and for those of you who don't like the Chicago Cubs. I don't either, but it's, you know, it's a hat that my wife um, gave me from her hometown. Thank you very much, Stephen. <clears throat> I'm still new enough to America that I don't really know the cultural context of the Chicago Cubs. Um, so I'm just gonna assume that that was an innocent remark, but thank you very much. It's always wonderful to talk to you. Um, and uh, I would encourage everyone listening to this to read your excellent book, which I have in preparation for the interview I did with you um, a little earlier in the year, uh, which you can also find on our website. So thank you very much, Stephen. Um, our next uh, event this evening uh, is a panel on the 20th Party Congress, which obviously has just concluded. And uh, everybody is in the, the, the China world is still trying to figure out exactly what it means. Um, so we have an excellent panel to talk about it, and it is going to be hosted by Kaiser Guo, who, as you know, is the host and co-founder, co co along with me, of the Seneca podcast. Um, and I'm proud to say that after more than a dozen, that's 12, years of recording weekly shows, uh, it is, uh, I can, you know, I live in America now, so I can be, uh, I don't have to be modest, it's the leading English language podcast on current affairs in China. Kaiser has produced and published more than 500 episodes of Seneca, featuring prominent diplomats, political leaders, academics, journalists, activists, technologists, business people with expertise on China, and occasionally me. Um, the Seneca podcast is also the flagship podcast of uh, the Seneca network on the China project. And I just like to put in a plug for that. Kaiser puts a lot of love into nurturing uh, a great cohort of other podcasters on specialist subjects. So please look those shows up if you've never listened to them. Kaiser, uh, enough uh, of the, uh, um, I won't say the word, over to you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Uh, and thank you to Stephen Roach, who I hope will nominate me for the US-China Secretariat. And whether it's based in Singapore or in Switzerland, I'm, I'm happy to serve. Uh, anyway, welcome again to all of you. And thank you so much for taking time out to join us. I am so pleased to be convening this panel in which we will look at the outcome outcomes of the 20th Party Congress, which was, of course, held just last month in Beijing. There is so much that came out of it, and no, not just the kerfuffle over the you know meaning of former General Secretary Hu Jintao's ignominious removal from the Great Hall of the People, which, by the way, I am not even going to ask about, as everyone already seems to have arrived at their own conclusions, and all new evidence seems only to confirm people in those conclusions. So our panelists are going to be familiar, I imagine, to most of you who are tuning in, as they have all spoken at our events before and have been guests on the Seneca podcast. Yun Sun is 
Senior Fellow and Co-Director of the East Asia Program and Director of the China Program at the Stimson Center in DC. She's one of the most astute observers of China's foreign policy and more, uh, who I have the pleasure to know. Thank you and uh, welcome to, you, to Yun Sun. Uh, Damien Ma heads Macro Polo, the in-house think tank of the Paulson Institute in Chicago, and is truly one of my go-to people to understand elite politics and economic policy in China. And finally, Jude Blanchett, who Jeremy always introduces as the euphoniously named Jude Blanchett. Uh, he is Freeman Chair at CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies in China, uh, uh, studies in DC. And he is, again, uh, one of the people who I turn to for wisdom and knowledge, uh, it's consistently a font of both. A warm welcome to all three of you. Um, I want to start with what most media coverage, and I dare say most analysis that I've seen, regard as, as sort of the big takeaways in terms of domestic Chinese politics. So we'll start with the domestic side, that the 20th Party Congress marked the end for that faction, uh, which is associated with the Communist Youth League and often seen rightly or wrongly as representing both greater market liberalization and forces for political liberalization. The general lament among uh, American analysts, at least, is that the outcome which promoted uh, what many would see as a whole central committee full of Xi Jinping yes men will mean that the quality of Chinese decision making is bound to deteriorate. Uh, there has been pushback, though, in some quarters, suggesting that perhaps the fact that Xi Jinping promoted so many people who are quite close to him and have been for, for decades, uh, these are trusted advisors, has promoted these people to the Politburo Standing Committee, means that said advisors will feel more comfortable speaking unpleasant truths to Xi, and this might be a good thing. So, Sun Yuyin, I want to turn to you first. Are you especially persuaded by either of these arguments, or do you have another way of approaching this question? Thank you, Kaiser. Thank you for the invitation. It's truly an honor. On this specific question, I might have a different perspective because we tend to judge the quality of the Chinese decision making with certain assumptions. And for the, well, the past four plus decades, the assumption is all the Chinese decision making and all the Chinese policies made was to serve the prioritized goal of economic development. So using that criteria, a lot of Xi Jinping's policy appears irrational or appears subpar because things like the zero COVID policy has had a detrimental effect over the Chinese economy. However, if you look at the same issue from a slightly different perspective, what if Xi Jinping's top priority is no longer economic growth? Or what if Xi Jinping and his team is of the belief that China has accumulated enough national wealth, and now it is time for China to prioritize something else, for example, national security, or the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, like the Xi Jinping and his, uh, his team would like to say. So those terms or those goals do not necessarily equate to the continued focus or the subject of all other national priorities to the economic growth. So if you, if you think, but from a different perspective of what objective they're trying to achieve and how those objectives are different from his predecessors. I think the question on the quality of his decision making will look very differently. Thank you. Oh, that's fascinating, absolutely. And uh, Jude, I want your take on this because while I wanna focus with you mainly on foreign policy related questions, I do want your perspective on whether we have tended to frame it maybe wrong, we're, we're maybe asking the wrong questions or or using the wrong criteria for, for judgment? Um, or maybe is the general disappointment that, that we sense over the outcome of the 20th Party Congress maybe a reflection of too much wishful thinking on our part or projection or anything like that? Yeah, I, I, it's a great question. I, the, the narrower question of what sort of, um, is, this a, is this a team of, of trusted supporters who will actually give more space for Xi Jinping to think out loud as it were, or, or are these you know, sycophants? I, you know, those are two theses that, that I think we all have to adopt the answer of, we don't know. Right. Um, this is one where the proof will be in the pudding and um, I, I could see plausible cases for it breaking both ways. I, I do think there's a, a common sense statement we could make though about the quality, the likely quality uh, of decision-making that you can expect within an increasingly bounded political discussion. And it's hard enough to get good policy outcomes in really 
um, sort of diverse political ecosystems where you have lots of ideas circulating, see Washington, D.C., um, I, I would imagine structurally we, we should expect that the bounds of discussion and discourse are going to be more narrow. My The way I've been thinking about the leadership team that Xi Jinping brought in, if I could drastically simplify, is we're essentially done with big debates uh, about massive swings in policy. I, I have an agenda that I want to drive, and you see it in the new development concept, dual circulation, supply side structural reform, and I want a team that rows in the same direction. Um, so I, I guess I haven't been thinking of it as the death of the you know youth league faction or sycophants versus, I've just been thinking about it from a governance perspective. I think he wants a team that's going to drive an agenda. And there's someone like, you know, Ho Wei Fung makes sense. Um, uh, and even on the Li Chang, you know, issue, the person who's now coming from Shanghai to be premier, a lot of the hot takes were focusing on the potential sycophancy of an individual who doesn't have central administrative experience and is being brought up because of his close relationship with Xi. That kind of makes sense. But having talked with a bunch of companies over the past few weeks who have engaged deeply with, with Li, they find him fairly pragmatic. Um, all of his known public statements on markets and, and private enterprise are positive. The one constraint for him will be he works for Xi Jinping. So this is the kind of the Steve Mnuchin problem. You can be pretty market friendly, but if you work for Donald Trump, he's going to set the course of policy. So it constrains you know, how much you can push back. So um, that's a long way of saying, I don't know. None of us know. This is one where we're going to have to see how, how things shake out. So talking about Li Chang is sort of a good segue into what I want to talk to Damien about, what I want to ask you about, Damien. Um, he's not the only person who, who's appointed who has sort of uh, a lot of, of experience in China's most economically dynamic geography, that is, you know, the Yangtze River Delta, so the provinces of Zhejiang and uh, Jiangsu, and of course, the city of Shanghai. Uh, there are a lot of people in the new administration who sort of have their power base there. What does that tell you about Xi's priorities and the likely quality of decisions, since we're talking about that, that are going to come out of, of, of Beijing? Well, Kaiser, it's, it's great to be with you again, um, virtually this time, but um, um, hope we'll catch up again in, in person. But, um, uh, you know, I probably agree with Jude that, the, that, 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 you know, the actions will count more than just a specific personnel makeup. But I think it is also true that when you look at um, uh, even beyond just the seven standing committee members, the Politburo is populated with uh, coastal, uh, coastal province party secretaries, um, whether they're, they've been helicoptered in, new, but they, uh, you can make a pretty strong case that she's got about 40% of the Chinese GDP locked down, which is about the, co which is the coastal provinces mm -hmm. with Zhejiang. And frankly, if you were to predict a uh, standing committee, you just had to look back into the early 2000s, Zhejiang Party, uh, Communist Party Standing Committee in Zhejiang, and basically most of those people made it into the National Pod Standing Committee. So uh, Zhejiang clearly is uh, central um, to Xi Jinping power base, but I think all along the coast from Shandong all the way to Guangdong. And I think it's not a coincidence that they already made Zhejiang a common prosperity um, pilot zone. So I think the key question is, if they are to pursue earnestly this common prosperity agenda, which word are they going to focus on more? Is it going to be the common part or is it going to be the prosperity part? So that kind mm. of gets at, are they going to focus on you know growth some more or are they going to focus on redistribution? So one plausible, logical uh, scenario, if you're thinking about, the uh, thinking about the political makeup is he needs people in the provinces, maybe because he wants to do more redistribution, which would logically go from the wealthy coastal provinces to sort of the inner uh, less developed provinces and that's going to get political so maybe he's preparing for you know a lot of political pushback which we would expect because it's going to involve a lot more taxation that's right that's right and we'll talk a little bit more about common prosperity in just a bit i want to turn to Sun Yun and ask you about Actually, Damien, I'd love you to have you weigh in on this as well. Uh, another sort of factional grouping that has been identified uh, is this so-called Beihang clique. Uh, there are a lot of new provincial party secretary appointments and ministerial level appointments of people who, if not actually graduates of Beihang, the former Beijing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics, but 
uh, are who come from hard sciences backgrounds. These are not the technocrats of yore who are sort of you know hydroelectric engineers worked on big projects, but these are all, you know literal rocket scientists in some cases. Ma Xing Rui, who is the new uh, party secretary in Xinjiang, for example, he's a, a good example of this. Um, so, so Sun Yun, what do you make of this? Is it significant in some way? What does it tell us? Uh, I have to say that I have not looked at that issue specifically because I've been primarily focused on uh, uh, foreign policy and security policy. So I will leave that question to Damien and to Ju. Okay. okay, Damien, what about you? I'll just make two very quick points. 30% uh, of the new Politburo is about technocrats and you're right, uh, Aerospace, Beihan University also, uh, you know, sa uh, satellites as well. I, I, I would count that and also uh, semiconductors. So I think what happened is that um, we, including the Chinese themselves, I think over the last decade and a half got overtaken by sort of, you know, this idea of, you know, um, 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 you know, tech, tech driven growth, but that tech was really the platform e-commerce, you know, software economy. Once that went away, and, and it's also kind of sort of gone away in the United States, but when that went away, U.S. still has a pretty solid core technological foundation. But what happened when when the Chinese looked at it is like they said, well, okay, we actually don't have as strong a technological foundation as we thought we did. A lot of it has been obscured by obscured by the growth of the you know um, the last decade of tech growth that wasn't in the core foundational technology. So they they realized they still had a deficit. And all these people that they've uh, decided to that she decided to appoint are you know core technology people. They're not software people. Uh, and and so I think there's absolutely correlation is that once the sort of the tech growth driver went away, they it, it sort of solves you know things that were masked and and they really need to you know uh, uh, improve those deficiencies. And that, I think that's what they're going to be there for to help uh, to help secure a certain level of technology technological supply change, which by the way happens at the provincial level. Yeah. And so uh, I, th I think I think we're, it's, it'll be interesting to follow the money to see where that money is being spent in which provinces, depending on which technocrat is running those provinces. It's interesting how that's sort of happening here, just as we're watching the implosion of uh, at least one big tech platform, possibly two. Uh, we're also seeing a big shift toward, you know, sort of the hard sciences in the United States as well, maybe in, in response to, to Beijing. Uh, so Jude, um, weigh in here. What, what do you think that this means? I mean, I think there's an obvious national security dimension to this as well. Would you agree? You mean insofar as the composition? That's uh, right. Yeah. I mean, well, just to add on to something Damien said, I also think someone like Chun Jining on the Politburo is also interesting for a slightly adjacent set of priorities that they have around uh, uh, environment, ecological civilization, as they call it. Um, so, you know, Chun Jining, sort of an environmental technocrat um, you know, who is now on who's now on the Politburo. Um, so if we're it's interesting how you look at it, because if you look at this by background, the signal, as Damien said, clearly being self sent is here's where the priorities are. Um, hard, you know, hard tech. And it's also you see this sort of broad shift of China's overall sort of five year plan uh, priorities it, as uh, instantiated in the academic, you know, research backgrounds of senior officials. So, you know, as you mentioned, uh, Kaiser it used to be, you know, hydro engineering, uh, you know, for people who were who were studying in the 50s and 60s, and and now we've moved on to a different set of of priorities. Um, the security issue is, I, I think, slightly separate from the the background here, but. And I don't want to get ahead of us, but something where you see in the, the work report, 20th Party Congress work report, how technology and security are uh, in core ways intertwined. By the way, the exact same way they are here in the United States uh, of America. So we're all kind of converging. We're all kind of converging on a view of technology that is it's not a separate domain from uh, uh, from national security. So I think China is in many ways was ahead of the curve on that. Um, and we're all, you know, it's China's world and we're all playing in it. Um, but again, I don't want to get ahead of us if we were going to talk you're, you're about not the report later. I think this is perfect, a perfect time for me to ask you about this because it really struck me that the U.S. national security strategy came out at practically the same time uh, that the 20th Party Congress was convening. And we've chatted about this before. What can we glean from reading that document and C's report in parallel as you've done? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, again, I, I'm repeating conversations we've had privately, but that's just... Um, 
uh, something that strikes me is just how in conversation the national security strategy and the and the work report are unacknowledged and in many ways unintentional but you see both articulating a set of concerns and fears about the external environment uh, in both you know china is central in the national security strategy the us is unspoken like Voldemort, but is clearly central in the 20th Party Congress um, work report. Both are operating at, on a set of uh, priors about the intentions of the other country, which, you know, um, have their own political logic behind them. Um, we did a, we held a track two with some friends that I know, Damien Sunyun and you know well the other night. And it was funny, all they wanted to talk about was the national security strategy. And their point was, Everyone has been reading the work report and pointing, counting how many times security was mentioned. We just read the national security strategy, and, and that seems to be painting an equally dark picture uh, of the bilateral relationship. Um, these sorts of documents are not places for self-reflection, so I don't think we should expect that China in the work report would, would acknowledge what it has done to contribute. Uh, to the deterioration and, and same for the national security strategy. Um, but we seem to be in a world where the, even the conversation around these two documents doesn't have a whole lot of um, uh, sort of introspection uh, about how it, priors and assumptions are really now being deeply hardwired into the way that we're viewing um, the relationships. And then the final point on this, though, is, and I think I mentioned this as well, um, I think everyone was taken aback in the work report <clears throat> by some of the framings of the external environment. When we were on this track two the other night, one of the participants said, damn right, and it's about 10 years too late. Um, <laughs> you know, the idea that China, you know, the, the, the 17th Party Congress should have said, China is moving into a very contested world where the period of strategic opportunity now is being threatened by challenges and, and where we're facing, you know, high winds, stormy waters and, and dangerous, uh, or uh, stormy seas and, and, and dangerous waters. So, I mean, I thought it was interesting, both Beijing and Washington are having this, this view that, um, the other side started it a long time ago. We're just finally recognizing it. Right. I mean, it's, there's been a whole bunch written about this framing of the international situation. Uh, you know, that the absence of this phrase, period of strategic opportunity. I mean, to me, that that proves conclusively one thing is that they're not entirely delusional, right? So, yeah. So, and I sorry to drone on here, but yeah, that, that's one where um, I think part of what we haven't done, at least in sort of U.S. analysts, is really understand what the function of the part of the work report is. It isn't for us. Right. Um, and so I think we narcissistically, you know, scan through the passages looking for something that that implicates or discusses us. But this is meant to be the highest level authoritative sort of temperature check for the party indication of what we can expect and where resources are going to be channeled. And as you said, it, it would be delusional if Xi Jinping was talking about the external environment as if it was 2002. Right. So I, I took this in many ways as a fairly pragmatic diagnosis um, of the world China faces in, in 2022. And, and even then I thought you could probably make the case that it was a relatively staid pragmatic diagnosis, not one that was sort of over the top. I, I know I'll get sort of, you know, canceled here in DC for saying that, but um, <laughs> I think if we understand it in that more sort of rational light as a signal, um, you know, a domestic signal, it, it, I think it makes complete sense. So Ian, uh, one of the takeaways that seems to be hardening into conventional wisdom, at least in DC, is this idea that C's 20th Party Congress work report or the report um, you know, it emphasizes national security and, you know, de-emphasizes economic development. Uh, there's been some healthy pushback against this idea. What do you think? Uh, do, you, do you think that, that we're reading this wrong? I don't think we're reading it wrong. I think it's just a matter of the selective evidence. You can try to find what you want to, what you want to hear from the document, right? And when the document first came out, a very prevalent interpretation is that, well, this represents continuity. Mm -hmm. 
And the reason that people see continuity is that every single sentence in that report can pretty much be identified in a government statement or government policy in the past two years. Well, but if you compare this document to the last party Congress report, the, signif the significance of the distinction and the differences just cannot be denied. And just in terms of the external relations, just to name a few, other than the, the frequent mentioning of, of the term national security, um, something that the Chinese used to treat as a as a mantra, what they used to say, quoting from Deng Xiaoping, that peace and development are the two themes of our era. And that sentence has been repeated for decades, and this time it's no longer included in the report. And another term that has been ha had been used in the past is the window of strategic opportunity for China is still open. Well, that has also been removed by in the document. So people do wonder what does that mean? So now we're going to prioritize national security. We're going to prioritize struggle. And I don't disagree with Jude that yes, international environment, the external environment has, has changed. And the, the Communist Party has to adapt that, their messaging and their policy according to that change. But to what extent was that change due to China's own change? And of course, we get into the finger pointing as for who started it, and there's not going to be a, a, a gratifying answer. But eventually, if you look at where China is today, I think a lot of the Chinese elites would even argue that, well, yes, it is an interactive process, and yes, Washington is to blame, but does China have any role to play in that process as well? Thank you. Yeah, no, oh, fantastic. Uh, Damien, I, maybe I don't, um, maybe I'm erecting a straw man here and please tell me if you think so, but it seems from where I sit that there was an awful lot of disappointment, especially in the business community and among investors that C neither gave any strong indication during the Congress nor uh, in the weeks that have followed that China is really ready to move away from what they call dynamic zero COVID and that C doesn't seem to take China's economic peril quite seriously enough. Is, is that your sense? And um, you know, please feel free to weigh in on this as well, Jude and 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 Suyin. Well, I think it's another case of sort of watch what they do and not listen too much to what they say. Um, you know, there's been some green shoots. I mean, I, you know, I don't think anybody thinks that there's going to be a you know lifting of, of of the current approach by the end of the fourth quarter. But I think uh, you know how much we want to give credit to the rumors. But I do think there has been a much more robust internal debate. Despite what the what they're saying publicly by the National Health Institute um, or uh, the equivalent of the Chinese CDC, um, that that uh, I think I think they are growing more concerned about uh, about the economy, um, but they're also stuck in a you know in between a rock and a hard place. So a, any plan to get out uh, is going to be a pretty gradual uh, gradual plan that needs to you know go in stages. And I think at this point. You would hope that a more optimistic scenario is that they do come up with a fairly uh, sensible plan around the National Party Congress in March, uh, which, which you know, so they start to kind of you know gradually let go and start to you know uh, vaccinate more. So hopefully by the end of the second or by you know by the second half of 2023, you're going to see uh, you're going to see uh, you know something that's 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 quite different than than what we're thinking to today. And I think the risk here is that I think. You know, for global investors and markets, they're looking at this, and you know, China's at risk of being sort of written off for 2023 again if they maintain mm -hmm. the current approach. And I think they they, they kind of realize that internally. So I wouldn't I wouldn't dismiss the current internal debate just because they haven't articulated a plan so publicly just yet, and because that's not how China works. They're not going right. to articulate publicly right now anyway. So I think there was a lot of unrealistic expectation that they would see kind of explicit language. Uh, coming out of the Congress about this, and I, I think that a lot of the seasoned watchers uh, were were poo pooing that idea that that we, we that understood that there wasn't likely to be any strong signals. Um, Jude, let's talk a little bit about what the language coming out of both the report and and the Congress more generally uh, tells us about Taiwan. I, I'm curious what the hawks with whom you have some truck, as I understand it, are, are actually saying about this in DC. I, you know, I think interestingly, this is a this is something of a case of the dog that didn't bark because mm -hmm. there was a widespread expectation in the months leading up to the party congress, and I heard this dozens of times in lots of different channels that that um, there was going to be new language on Taiwan in the work report, 
And I, the expectation began to be that, well, if there's going to be new language, it's going to be bad. Maybe this is a more explicit timeline for uh, unification. And what we got was something much different. Um, and so even though a lot of the language in the Taiwan section was what you know many would call continuity, these are statements we've heard before, there is an interesting back to, uh, you know, uh, back to uh, Yun Sun's point about, did we have the right framing going in? Um, uh, we were expecting something that didn't occur. Um, and in fact, I think you could look at the language broadly as more mild um, than even I was expecting with, yes, the same stock language on we don't promise to renounce the use of force, but that comes at the end of the sec of a two and a half page section on uh, uh, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, comes after the, the very clear indication that peaceful reunification remains the best path to unification. Um, the, the, the section is not free from menace uh, because it's clear what Xi Jinping is hinting at, but this is one where, um, and I just had this discussion today, we either, we either take Xi Jinping's words on Taiwan seriously or we don't, we can't selectively use them. So some and will we go, <laughs> well, that's the point is some will, you know, it, the argument I had today is some said, well, of course he's saying that. But, but they don't mean it. And I said, well, okay, then you can't build a case that China wants to invade by referencing Xi's 29, you know, January 2019 speech on not passing this down from generation to generation, right? We've got to take this in toto. Um, what has he said at the highest authoritative level on Taiwan? And frankly, what signals does it send? Um, and, and the signal that I think Xi is trying to send here is um, we're, we're, we're not announcing any new aggressive policy or approach. We still see this as a relatively long-term challenge uh, to manage, but I think he's also trying to signal domestically that um, my policy hasn't failed and we'll get there one day. Um, of course, Taiwan was also incorporated into the, the constitution in an amendment um, about deterring Taiwan independence. So I think they're trying to, you know, they're trying to deter by signaling, you know, increasing resolve that we're, we're getting really mad now. Um, but I, I think this could have been much, much worse. And final point, Kaiser, is, you know, as we move into this much more, you know, rivalrous relationship, I just worry we're never going to be picking up signals when they're being sent. If Xi Jinping had had aggressive language, it would confirm our view that he wants to invade. When Xi Jinping doesn't have as aggressive language, it doesn't seem to affect our assessment at, at all. Um, and, and I just think that's, that's worrying. I'm not saying we need to now come to the position that there's no problem and trying to um, isn't menacing Taiwan. Um, but I think there was a clear signal. There's a clear signal being sent that I don't think we've tuned into in DC. So in, in the weeks since the end of the party Congress, we've seen China go on what some people have described as a charm offensive. Uh, do you agree that this has been the case? And, and what is the evidence for or against? Uh, I think it is because, but that was also expected because uh, China's foreign policy activities, especially the senior senior leaders' visits, have been uh, had been under severe constraint because of the COVID policy and because of the domestic priority on the Party Congress. Uh, Xi Jinping had his first overseas trip to Central Asia in September, which was one month before the Party Congress, and I think that was already signaling that more intense. Foreign policy uh, activities will be will be online once the party congress is over. It's not surprising that uh, that the leader of Vietnam was invited to Beijing. Uh, this actually there is a tradition that after each party congress, Communist Party will reach out to other communist countries or other communist parties to uh, to demonstrate or to inform them of the achievements and of also the policy changes from the party congress. So the visit by the Vietnam uh, Secretary General. Uh, Secretary General of the Vietnamese Communist Party is not that surprising. I think a lot of people were uh, more or less taken back by German Chancellor Scholz's visit to Beijing, because we know that this has happened at a time when China is quite anxious about the, um, the piling up of the US restrictions, um, for example, semiconductor chips on China. And China is looking at Europe for the substitution, the alternative access to uh, technologies, to equipments, and also to products. So the fact that the German chancellor took the trip and had a very fruitful, many people would say very fruitful result of the trip, I think that is a diplomatic victory from Beijing's perspective. 
And then Xi Jinping is going to visit uh, Indonesia for the G20. There's going to be the APEC meeting. So we are looking at a very intense foreign policy activities out of the uh, out of the Chinese capital. Uh, staying with you, Sunyi, you've noted that there are quite a number of Europeanists who've been promoted uh, in this Party Congress session, um, given Schultz's uh, Olaf Schultz's recent visit to China, this charm offensive that we've been talking about. Uh, what is the significance of this emphasis on Europe? I mean, is it just simply, you know, pushing for European strategic autonomy, which has been a longstanding goal of of Chinese foreign policy, or what should we read into it? Well, traditionally for the foreign policy apparatus, there is the Asia school or the Asianist, the people who specialize in Asian affairs. And there was also the school, a competitive school of the school of uh, what they call the North Americanist. This, those are the people who worked or who rose to uh, to the leadership position from the Department of North America. But now with this new central committee among the five members who are responsible for foreign policy uh, among the 205 members of the central committee, three out of the five, they come from a relatively um, strong European background, especially Liu Haixin who majored French who was vice minister for for European affairs and who was executive vice director uh, vice executive director of the National Security Commission's office. Right. So we are looking at a pivoting away from the traditional emphasis of the Chinese foreign policy on North America, the so relationship with the United States. And also you could even argue that a little pivot away from the, the traditional Asia focus because um, Asia is all, is also regarded as China's core priority in terms of the foreign policy. So I think it does suggest that China sees Europe as more and more important in this current international dynamics, and especially in this contest for global audience and global um, for global engagement with the United States. Yeah, fantastic. Um, there is one appointment, though, of a, a well-known North Americanist, uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Xin Gang, who, of course, has been serving as the Chinese ambassador to the United States. He's been. Can I, uh, can I make yeah. a comment on that? Qin sure, is not. Oh, Qin Gang is not regarded as a traditional North Americanist because okay. if you look at his background, he was working as a spokesperson, so information office and then protocols office. So uh, his only experience with North America is has been this ambassadorial posting, which That's started right. in July last year. So it's not a significant amount of experience. Thank okay. You. So, but then what what should we read into his promotion? And I mean, his likely elevation actually to, to, to <laughs> his well rumored man. promotion. Uh, I, I think it actually reflects a Chinese emphasis on public relations or public messaging and public diplomacy. Both Liu Jianchao and Qin Gang, uh, Liu Jianchao has become the uh, director of the International Liaison Department of the Communist Party. And if Qin Gang is named the foreign minister, I think it would not be a coincidence as both of them have served as a spokesperson of the Chinese foreign ministry. So I think the appointment actually reflects a Chinese desire to improve relations with the rest of the world, to improve China's image, and also to win this battle, this, this battle in narratives and in discourse vis-a-vis -vis the United States. I'm going to actually, I know that we only have a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to actually aim this last question uh, first toward, toward Sun Yun, but if you both have something to say about it. I mean, Sun Yun was one of the people I talked to first after the February 24th invasion uh, of Ukraine uh, by Russia. And I think you offered such an intelligent framing of China's position in, in that conflict. Uh, have you changed your mind on this or, or what, where would you place China right now in the Ukraine conflict? Uh, I have not changed my mind, but I think the Chinese assessment of Russia is subtly changing as well. One takeaway for both United States and China out of the Russians war in Ukraine is that, well, there has been a reassessment of Russia's power as a, well, Russia's capability as a military power. And the conclusion is that maybe we have overestimated Russia's essence or Russia's capability as a strong military power. And I think that has significant impact over how China will treat Russia down the road. For example, the statement with uh, German Chancellor shows that nuclear weapons or threat of use of nuclear weapons and threat to use nuclear weapons should never happen. It should not, it should not, it should not happen in the case, in any case. 
So that's a pretty strong message that I was not anticipating China to make. But the fact that, that China did make that position, did make that commitment, I think it shows a recalculation of how important Russia is for China's foreign policy and how much cost that China is still willing to carry for the sake of Russia. Okay, uh, we are at time and I wanna be respectful of that. So I wanna thank the panel. Thank you so much, Damien. Thank you so much, Jude. And thank you so much, Suyin, for, for joining. And uh, I hope that our audience got a lot out of this. I certainly did. Thanks so much. Over back to you, Jeremy. Um, Damien, Yun, Jude, Kaiser, you gang of four, you. That was a really uh, fascinating chat. Uh, thank you very much. Our next panel tonight is Rebuilding Trade Routes. Our moderator is Matthew Rabinowitz, counsel at Pillsbury. Matthew advises companies on compliance with uh, import and export regulations, anti-corruption laws, sanctions under the Office of Foreign Assets uh, Control, and various matters connected with CFIUS. That's the Fearsome American Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Um, as counsel in Pillsbury's International Trade Group, Matthew works with companies to obtain classifications and licenses for EAR and ITAR controlled items and various um, uh, fields connected with uh, uh, comprehensive FCPA policies and procedures. Before I hand over to Matthew, let's watch a quick intro video that will help you better situate uh, the panel. And with that, Matthew, over to you. Please turn your camera on and uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Nice to be with you all. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'd love to start off by introducing our, our very uh, esteemed panelists who will be joining us for this lively discussion. And we don't have much time, so, so I'll, I'll go through the introductions and then uh, start the discussion. So first, we're joined by Margaret Pearson. Margaret is a Dr. Horace E. and Wilma V. Harrison Distinguished Professor and Distinguished Scholar Teacher in the Department of Government and Politics at the University of Maryland in College Park. Margaret's research on China's domestic politics focuses on state control of the economy, central local bureaucratic relations, and environmental policy. On Chinese foreign policy, Margaret's ongoing projects focus on conceptualizations and of and reactions to China's overseas economic activities, determinants of Beijing's behavior in global institutions, and climate change governance. She teaches courses on Chinese domestic politics and foreign policy, as well as on comparative politics. Margaret has held a Fulbright Research Fellowship at Beijing University, received a PhD in political science from Yale University, and was an associate professor, uh, professor with tenure at Dartmouth College. Her books include China's Strategic Multilateralism, Investing in Global Governance, uh, China's New Business Elite, The Political Results of Economic Reform, and Joint Ventures in the Pu People's Republic of China. So well, thank you for, for joining, Margaret. Uh, next, we have Thomas Christensen. Thomas is the Interim Dean and James T. Shotwell Professor of International Relations and Director of the China and the World Program at Columbia University. From 2006 to 2008, he served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs with responsibility for relations with China, Taiwan, and Mongolia. His research and teaching focus on China's foreign relations, international relations of East Asia, and international security. And last but not least, we have Joseph Zhang. Mr. Zhang is the founder and chairman of Arcadia Fund Management, focusing on managing private investments of convertible bonds and equities into public companies listed in Hong Kong, mainland China, and Southeast Asian markets such as Singapore, Vietnam, and Indonesia. Mr. Zhang has over 20 years of experience in investments, deal origination, and management, and he was the CEO of Greenwoods Asset Management Hong Kong 
in 2008, for, from 2008 to 2022, focusing on investments in pipes, pre-IPOs and IPOs, as well as overall management of Greenwood's international business. Uh, before that, he was the investment banker with JP Morgan, covering IPOs and M&As of China's banks, insurers, and asset managers. Mr. Zhang is the vice chairman of the China Committee of the Hong Kong Venture Capital and Private Equity Association. He holds a degree of Master in Accounting and Finance from the London School of Economics with a Robert Fleming Scholarship. So thank you all for, for joining this, this panel. Um, today we'll be focused on uh, international trade and, and trade barriers. Um, I'd like to sort of set the stage and, and Margaret, we'll turn it over to you to do that. And, you know, where we are today is a time in which US and China's economic relations are at the forefront. As strategic comp competition is a core element of the relationship between the US and China. Yet at the same time, US and Chinese business interests have a huge financial stake in the other's economy. So can you tell us, how do we get to this situation of massive mistrust on the economic front when globalization and interdependence were supposed to be this arena for cooperation between these two countries? Thank you so much uh, for your kind introduction, Matt. Um, yeah, how did we get here indeed? Uh, well, it was merely two decades ago that US and political and industry leaders were actually touting economic interdependence with China as a sure pathway to peace and prosperity in Asia and beyond. But since then, uh, even in the times of Obama and who administrations, mutual distrust has really mushroomed. Uh, and now every month, it seems, brings new restrictions on how US businesses interact with China, uh, leading to really unprecedented barriers on uh, global capital and trade flows in the name of protecting national security from interdependence with China. So we really have your mutual securitization of our two economies. So how did radical change happen really so fast? Um, you know, there are many routes, um, but I think it is useful to focus on some major inflection points uh, in China. So China's political economy, really its model has changed profoundly over the last decade. Uh, and these changes really somewhat predate Xi Jinping, but contrary to the view that the Chinese Communist Party has been running a 100-year marathon to dominate supply chains and, and displace the US, these changes really were based on a series, uh, on a sense in China of being backed into a corner. Uh, and so these changes largely were a reaction by the party to perceptions of domestic insecurity, some economic insecurity, some political. Uh, and threatening, and, and also based on um, <clears throat> perceptions of threats from international events, such as the color revolutions, uh, the Snowden revelations of the NSA um, uh, backdoors into Huawei servers and so forth. And these perceptions of insecurity pushed China from a model emphasizing economic growth at all costs to a model based on really an obsession with risk management and national security. So with my um, colleagues, Meg Rithmeyer and Kelly Tsai, we've come to call this party state capitalism. And uh, we know that it has some really um, signature features. One is financialization of the economy or the expansion of state and state-backed finance into private firms. Uh, one upshot of this is that combined with industrial policy initiatives such as the Made in China 2025 and, and uh, military civil fusion, uh, this financialization is an ever more pronounced state penetration of the most strategic sectors in China. I, I do want to mention that this kind of um, state penetration uh, into strategic sectors doesn't cover the whole economy. Uh, indeed, uh, the small and medium enterprise sector uh, really hasn't been touched in this way. Um, second, though, we see that securitization of the economy has been baked into new laws, such as the national security law that really envelops Chinese firms into a national security network. And then there's all sorts of imperatives for political fealty by domestic firms and, and uh, multinationals to say the right thing if they want to participate in the market. So, you know, Beijing sees these steps as defensive in nature. Uh, they say we were dependent on foreign firms for inputs like semiconductors, 
we got worried these company these countries would weaponize their dominance uh, to spy on us or cut us off. So we developed some policies to spur our upgrading and uh, self reliance. You know, and this narrative um, really reflects deep concerns about China's weaknesses and asymmetries between China and its competitors. So on our side, uh, China's economic model. Uh, sort of resulted in a blurring, a perception of a great, well, and the reality of a great blurring between the Chinese state and Chinese firms uh, and between state-owned enterprises and private firms. Uh, and it, com that combined with language that we interpreted as offensive, um, we raised suspicion and confusion outside of China. So um, sort of in classic security dilemma fashion, China's actions to protect its own security have stoked an obsession uh, outside of China and in the US with risk management and national security uh, uh, in our dealings with China. So again, a security dilemma dynamic, uh, this time in the economic realm, which was never uh, thought to be the focus of it, but here we are. So I think we'll be obviously talking about some of the specifics of this, but there's a, a basic um, perspective. Yeah, great. Th thank you, Barbara. And yeah, you certainly hit on, on a couple of those keywords national security and semiconductors. Uh, that, that is, that is um, certainly in my day-to-day, -day, uh, taking up a bulk of my time in the export control world, um, assessing you know, these new export control rules that many of you uh, participating in this panel will be well aware of. I'd, I'd love from, from that to take that point and kick it over to Thomas to really understand, if you could help us understand really, you know, what are these export controls? We know that at a high level, the US government has implemented export controls that are really targeted at what we'll call advanced computer chips or advanced ICs and semiconductor production equipment and technology. Um, but really sort of beyond that, what, what's the policy rationale here? What is the US government trying to achieve um, through these export controls? Well, thanks a lot, Matt. Thanks for having me. Um, it's great to be on the panel with Margaret and, and Joseph. Um, I, uh, I think that they're, what we're trying to do, the United States is trying to do is to try to prevent China from closing the gap with the United States in these advanced semiconductor uh, technologies, both uh, by acquiring the, uh, the semiconductors, but uh, more important by being able to produce them themselves um, and to catch up with the United States in the, in the creation of uh, semiconductor manufacturing equipment, the SMEs that you referred to before. And the reason is that these technologies are very important for the next generation of weapon systems. Uh, unmanned automated weapon systems that use uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, it's not really a new concept in US foreign policy to have export controls, as you suggested in your question. Uh, when I was in the government during the Bush administration, uh, we had a list of 30 plus technologies that we didn't share uh, with China because we believed that those technologies would uh, speed China's military modernization. So for example, uh, American companies can't uh, teach the Chinese how to make jet engines, um, which were pretty direct military application. Um, similarly, as you know, there are regulations on China's investment into the United States uh, to purchase uh, shares or ownership of US companies that have technologies with national security implications. So that's the baseline that's always been there. Um, in the past, the idea has been both through the export controls and through CFIUS, those, in, those restrictions on internal incoming investment, um, was that to, you wanted to build a high fence around a small yard. In other words, you wanted to have limit your restrictions to things that really were related to military security and national security and try to prevent those, uh, those regulations and those controls from damaging the overall US-China economic relationship or the overall Chinese economy. The goal wasn't to slow down Chinese growth writ large, it was to uh, try to avoid assisting in the fast paced modernization of the Chinese military in particular. Now, because semiconductors are so important um, to the broad economy, um, almost everything manufactured now uses semiconductors, um, this type of export control can have uh, very large scale impact on the Chinese economy over time. We, we've yet to see how this is going to play out, but uh, in theory, it really could, especially if the list of um, export controls on semiconductors and on semiconductor manufacturing equipment grows over time. 
uh, it could become quite large and quite damaging to the overall economy. And what intensifies this, this uh, particular con control, these particular export controls, is uh, what's called the product, foreign product rule, which is uh, it applies not only to American companies selling things to China, it applies to any foreign actor who is using US technology. If they sell their final products to China, they will be subject to US sanctions. And that creates a big multiplier effect uh, potentially on these export controls. And um, that's why I think it could have a very large impact. We have to see, and I have to express one concern is that I, I wonder how much thought has gone through the US government process on the second, third and fourth order effects of these types of export controls. Um, in general, uh, they make sense. You don't want to be selling technology to China that speeds PLA modernization. That's not containment, that is not an overall containment of the Chinese economy. It doesn't necessarily have to disturb all aspects of US-China economic relations. Um, but if it's not carefully thought through on something as essential to a modern economy as uh, semiconductors and the production of semiconductors, one could imagine what was intended to be a relatively limited measure becoming much more consequential uh, over time. Great, thanks Thomas. That's all great, great insight. Um, and I think you're, you're leading into the, to the next real point here from these export controls, which is, could we understand sort of what the rationale is, what the US is looking to achieve? I guess, Joseph, let me bring you in here to get your perspective. You know, practically speaking, looking at it from an investment perspective, what do you see as the impact of these export controls? You know, when you're looking at portfolio companies or, or, or whether it be a, a US company or a Chinese company um, or a company in a third country, that might be caught up by this foreign direct product rule. What, how does this impact you in your day to day? And what do you see as the impact of these export controls in the real world? Thank you. It's my honor to be here and invited by Anna and moderated by you. Uh, on your question, I believe the uh, latest regulatory changes in the US against China is absolutely a step back. Can you hear me? It is yes. uh, an absolute setback and challenge for China, for China's tech ambitions and for China's military plan, you know, it is. Um, but in the meantime, we have also seen mitigations to this. You know, I'm a local uh, asset manager, so I follow the developments of not only Chinese policies, but also the developments of tech companies in China. So what we have seen is, uh, for example, Chinese tech giants like uh, SMIC, the largest chip maker in China, the homegrown one. Uh, they are very active and aggressive in doing their own R&Ds. And their development has been encouraging for China because uh, somewhere in July this year, uh, they are able to make chips as small as seven nanometers. Uh, we know the latest and uh, uh, the most developed technology in the world is you know, three nanometers and even one nanometer now. But the gap between the, the, the most advanced technology in the world and China, the gap is narrower and narrower. You know, China can make seven nanometers. It's public info, you know, you can, you can search for it. Um, so that's number one. So the trillions of dollars of investment made by Chinese uh, companies, by Chinese government, are, we are seeing uh, progress and uh, deliveries. That's number one. Some of the investments are not that efficient. There are a lot of money pouring into this sector in China, and some of them, as I say, are not that efficient, but we have seen progress. Number two, uh, Chinese companies are also trying to use the R&D to overcome some of the um, technical uh, obstacles through innovations. For example, you heard about Huawei, right? It is a target of US government, and they are quite innovative in doing R&D, by achieving a technology called, I think it's called stacking. You know, I'm not sure about it's the jargon in English. What it means is, you know, basically, to by putting together several chips together to achieve the function of one uh, very very advanced chip developed by the American. So it is a it is a it is a good solution. You know, even it's not as small as the American one, as the most advanced one, but it is a solution putting together, stacking the, the, the chips together. 
there's another advanced technology called chiplet, C-H-I-P-L-E-T. Uh, chiplet is not something new. It was actually originally brought up by Gordon Moore in, I think, in 1960s. And a lot of U.S. companies like Intel, AMD, uh, AMD and Taiwanese companies, TSMC, they're all doing this. And Chinese companies are also doing this, chiplet. Basically, it's like dissecting the chip into smaller pieces called chiplets and then put, reconstruct them and assemble them together right, to achieve the function of a, a tiny little chip. So these are technology advancements that can sort of overcome the restrictions on, you know, by the US government on, 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 on countries like, on, on, like China. The third observations I make is that foreign companies, including American, company, uh, American companies are providing compliant solutions to China. You know, there is a company called NVIDIA in the US, which is very advanced in making GPUs. And their products are, you know, some of their most advanced products are on the restricted list of the US government. Um, one of them is called A100, the chip. And NVIDIA is making a new product called A A100, which is compliant to the US government's regulation. But it also, it can achieve most of the functions of the A100 restricted by the US government. And NVIDIA is supplying this uh, A 800 chip to China in the third quarter uh, this year. Um, so this chip, less events, but it's good enough. It's being used by you know, companies like Baba, by like Tencent, like Baidu in China. Um, again, it is not a perfect substitution, but it can achieve most of the functions of the uh, restricted chip. Lastly, uh, the observation I make is some other foreign players like ASML. ASML, as you know, is the most advanced maker of the uh, machine uh, to make the chips. And it is also restricted by the US government in terms of exports to China. And ASML is expanding into China, you know, not exporting the, tech, the uh, equipment, but it's setting up its local offices in China. Now it has 15 offices in China, 11 warehouses in China, three R&D centers in China with over 1,500 staff in China. They released this data in the, in the current Shanghai World Expo. They still attend it, they, they go to China, you know, they release their figures, so it's all transparent. So as we can see, you know, companies are providing substitute solutions. You know? um, so I think, again, as a summary, the, the US regulations against China, it is challenging for China's tech ambition, but you know, there, there could be some solutions and also China is, in, is investing heavily to try to narrow the gap. Um, I think it takes maybe another seven, 10 years, you know, but it's, it's working toward this direction. Thanks, Matt, if I could say something about the strategy, because you you asked about strategy and why yeah, it's sure. happening. I, I think there's a strategic uh, dilemma for the United States in how it handles its, uh, its uh, economic relations with China under current circumstances. The export controls we're talking about are really designed to keep China weaker than it would otherwise be as a nation in certain aspects of its economy that are related to the military. It, that, those export controls are not uh, um, related in any way to specific Chinese behaviors, specific Chinese policies. They're just designed to keep the PRC in this aspect of their economy weaker. Um, they're not sanctions. People call them sanctions. They're not sanctions. And sanctions are generally leveled to punish objectionable behavior by foreign actors, or they're threatened to be leveled if the foreign actor takes some action that is considered prohibited or prescribed by the country that is uh, leveling the threat. So they're conditional on behavior. And these two, types of, these two types of policies can work at cross purposes. And at present, the United States is putting in export controls that are designed to keep China from closing the gap that Joseph laid out so well. 
um, as a kind of general thing. It doesn't matter how the PRC behaves toward Taiwan, toward Russia, toward anybody else. We just don't want them to close that gap as quickly as they would if they had this equipment. At the same time, the United States is threatening Chinese semiconductor producers with even broader sanctions, much broader sanctions, if China sells semiconductors to Russia while Russia's under sanctions from the international community because of the invasion of Ukraine. And quite impressively, those sanctions really have apparently worked. Uh, China hasn't sold semiconductors, it hasn't sold airplane parts or airplanes to Russia, despite the fact that Xi Jinping is very close with Putin and doesn't want his economy to be harmed by these sanctions. Uh, China has basically complied by, uh, with those, those threats uh, by the United States, by the EU and other allies and partners. The problem is if the export controls expand to such a degree that China's semiconductor industry is being damaged regardless of Chinese behavior, that could undercut the leverage uh, that the United States has on things like pressuring China not to sell certain types of economic goods to Russia because they're because their, their semiconductor industry, their, their tech industry is already being hurt uh, without, regardless of their behavior. So I think there is a kind of tension there between sanctions and the threat of sanctions and these more general export controls that are designed to keep a country weaker. Got it, yeah, great. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, great, great insight, Thomas. And, and let me, let me, let's stay here for a minute. I wanna get, bring Margaret in to get her, her feedback here and thoughts and perspective. Curious, Margaret, you know, Joseph did a great job of laying out how China is looking to close the gap. I'm curious if, you know, from your perspective, how do you see these export controls playing out in terms of the U.S. government looking to then, as Thomas was just mentioning, expand that gap yet again? Do you see these export controls as a moving target? Um, you know, Joseph mentioned SMIC. They're already on what's called the entity list, which is a broader set of export control license requirements. Um, Joseph mentioned NVIDIA providing new products. Do you see the U.S. altering its export controls in a way to, to continue to broaden that gap? Uh, how do you see this sort of play out um, as both countries look to, to try to maintain technological leadership? Yeah, well, it's a great question. And I, I think it's a little bit of an unknown, but I fear that it is a moving target that the U.S. will try to chase, uh, perhaps to no avail, uh, and might perhaps lead to some of the broadening of the scope of these um, export controls in ways that Tom um, has also warned about, you know, moving outside of the small yard with big fences to bigger and bigger yards with lower and lower fences. Uh, I am concerned about it a little bit because. Um, you know, it's obviously a political issue, right? I mean, a, 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 an issue of um, um, sort of electoral politics. It has become an issue of electoral politics, even though there are some who are very serious minded in thinking about it uh, for, you know, a not insignificant number of players in this game. Uh, it's also, you know, something uh, perhaps related to presidential ambitions or, or that. And, and so the stakes are so high for, um, U.S. businesses and for um, the really meeting of the goals that we should have for it, uh, I worry that some of the counter forces in U.S. politics will undermine those. So, yeah, I, I, I do uh, think it's likely to be a moving, expanding target. Um, and just a second, what Tom said, you know, who in, who in D.C. is thinking seriously um, about the second order effects, uh, about the ultimate effectiveness of these and how are they scoping that out? Uh, I don't think that's been made very clear. Great, got it, understood. And so Joseph, let, let me bring you back in for, for a moment. And you mentioned sort of the, um, how Chinese companies are looking to navigate these export controls. What about what about from the investor perspective, you know, a fund or other um, um, party looking to looking at different investment opportunities? How would those parties be looking at this this um, regulatory landscape, and how is it impacting their investment decisions? Thank you, Matt. Um, as I say, you know, as you know, I'm a fund manager, so I'm not an economist or politician or professor. So all my observations and actions are from a fund management perspective. So for us, um, what we have been uh, active is to consider, you know, pair trades to allow the beneficiaries of the you know, regulations 
restriction in the meantime. We call it a chip war. In the meantime, short the victims. You know, I think that's the safe play. We have seen big volatility of semiconductor stocks in both the US and China. Actually, since Trump's policies restricting exports to uh, on semiconductor products to China. And some of the share price, uh, some of the share price of Chinese uh, chip makers, even some US chip makers actually recover uh, after the uh, October policies by Biden. So, you know, this kind of volatility uh, provides good uh, pair trade opportunities from a fund investment uh, perspective. I, I'm, I, I do not want to go into names because you know, there is a regulation about this. So I, I won't talk about specific names, they'd be long or short. Um, and a lot of US hedge funds uh, short Chinese uh, companies aggressively. Uh, that's uh, my observation of my peers. My fear warning to this is that uh, betting against uh, one side of the story, such as the restricted policies against China, is not complete and can be risky because it's very important to know the dynamics on both sides of the Pacific. Um, for me, the Chinese companies' performance in their stock price are always more correlated with China's growth. China's domestic policies, such as the COVID policy, you know, China's uh, own development policies, as well as the corporate fundamentals, uh, core competencies, R&Ds of the Chinese companies. So just making macro bets on China you know, could be profitable for some time. But for me, as a bottom-up stock picker, a manager, I still believe it's more important to look at corporate fundamentals. Uh, for example, I mentioned the chiplet technology, if you remember, um, technology, you know, which is being used by Intel, by NVIDIA, uh, by AMD. And also there are Chinese companies doing this. You know, uh, a lot of them are listed in the Asia market um, and they actually benefit from this. So I think, again, it's very important to, um, to look at the specific themes and the winners and losers of each theme. And also my last comment is, uh, since our, our uh, panel is about trying to trade, I want to share with you some observations on the trade perspective. Um, we all know it's a tough year for China this year, um, but even so, we still see China's trade surplus continue to increase in 2022. So far this year, over the first three quarters, China's trade uh, current account surplus is a uh, 310 billion US dollars, including trade surplus of 521 billion US dollars. But th there is a trade, there is a service trade deficit for China, which is a uh, 65.6 .6 billion US dollars. So China still export a lot. The summary is China still export a lot, uh, but China import more in service. You know, this is good because US is very strong in service as we all know. So I think going forward, the uh, US and China can achieve a trade balance through more exports of trade services, of services from the US to China. And China's, China achieved capital account surplus of 46.9 billion US dollars. So it means there are still strong inflows of foreign investment into China. Um, as a result, China is now the largest car exporters in the world, surpassing Europe. You may not know this. And also China export, uh, China produce three fourths of um, the, the, the solar products in the world. And it's the biggest exporter of solar products to the world, helping the whole world achieving ESG and also mitigating the risk of the Russia Ukraine war because the demand for alternative clean energy in the world is surging due to the uh, rising uh, uh, traditional oil, fossil oil, I mean, fossil energy price. I wanna stop here, you know, but great. I wanna share my observations and data. Yeah, that's great. Those are, those are great observations and appreciate um, your perspective on all this. I think we could probably talk about export controls for an entire day. Um, so in, in the few minutes we have left, I would like to touch on one other area of U.S. regulation that could be coming down the pike, and and Tom, let me get your thoughts on this. You know, there have been reports on, uh, and as, as many who may know, CFIUS 
looks at in regulating foreign investment in the U.S. Um, and looking at foreign investors looking to acquire or invest in U.S. businesses. There have been talks for many years over regulating the outbound investment side, whether that be capital coming from U.S. investment funds or technology transfer out of the U.S. Um, there are reports that this could come via legislation or even executive order. Tom, maybe you can put on your government hat for a moment and give your perspective on where you see an outbound regime, whether that's likely or or I may play a little bit of crystal ball and see what, what your perspective is on the likelihood of this coming into play. Yeah, there's a lot of people pushing back on this, as you probably know, Matt, that um, it, a lot of people think it's unnecessary and a lot of people don't really understand how it would work in practice. It's much more con controversial than CFIUS, which has been around for a long time, as you know. Um, and uh, the idea is that US investors would somehow be accelerating the development of military related technologies in China by investing abroad um, and that the investments might carry with them uh, either an incentive or a requirement to, to transfer tech. Um, and one of the complaints for those who are opposed to this is that you already have the export controls from, from commerce on technology transfers. And those should do the trick for investors as well without blocking their capital from going in. So their capital would be able to go in, but their technology would not accompany the capital, even if the Chinese recipients of the capital were saying tech transfer is a, is a requirement for some sort of agreement. Um, a second problem with the approach is that there's not really a shortage of capital in those military relevant sectors in China. So it's not as if the United States uh, would cut off capital to those sectors, that those sectors would be, then be starved of capital because the Chinese government is subsidizing those industries very heavily. Uh, Margaret talked about how this goes back. This goes back before the financial crisis, but it has accelerated since then. Uh, China's been trying to create more self-reliance in those areas. So those, those, those areas are not really starved of capital. And I guess you could make an argument that there are these Silicon Valley uh, investment firms that are really great at picking winners, uh, and that if they got, if they invested in China, they'd be sending a signal to others in China about which companies are better than others, and therefore accelerate uh, China's uh, te technological innovation in those military-related areas. But I think it's kind of a stretch. Um, so I guess my sense is this is going to be very hard to control. And having worked in the U.S. government, cap outflow outflow capital is very hard to control. If someone sends money to Joseph's firm in Hong Kong and that firm is sending money to the mainland, who's going to who's going to police all of that? Um, the bureaucracy would have to be very large and very sophisticated for it to be effective. And I think uh, much more than with the export controls, where the U.S. really can pressure, you might want to say bully uh, third countries into not selling the technology to, ch to Chinese firms because they rely on U.S. Uh, technology. I think it'd be very hard to get the European Union and other advanced economies to go along with the United States on, uh, on capital controls uh, against investment in China. So I'm not saying it won't happen, Matt. I'm just saying that I think there are a lot of people resisting it. And I'm saying that if it does happen, I'm skeptical about how effective it will be to produce the results that it's trying to produce. I'm sure it will produce a lot of heat in the U.S.-China relationship because it's a sign of a, a kind of a, a kind. Of, it's a kind of a, a, a sign of animosity. But I don't know if it will actually produce the same kinds of results that uh, the more limited export controls in the past have produced. Got it. Great. No, thanks, Tom. And let me, uh, Margaret, I'll give you the last word here as, as we close out the panel. Curious if you if you share that perspective um, in terms of, and particularly what the impact of any type of outbound regime might look like. And I guess just one way to, to keep things a bit more topical, we're, we're one day out of uh, the midterm elections. The uh, the red wave that was supposed to be coming is, isn't quite there. We'll probably see a, a Republican House, though. On the legislative front, do you see the congressional change at all? impact the likelihood of this type of legislation outbound investment or, or what do you see in terms of impact and likelihood of some type of outbound investment regime being put in place? Sure. I, I would really just second uh, what Tom said that the that I think it there will be efforts to make it happen. It may be that the Senate, uh, regardless of whether it's Republican or Democrat, um, slows it down a little bit, tries to make make it a little bit more reasonable and doable. But the 
question of whether it actually can work and whether any benefits that are gained from it would uh, be offset by all the heat and the difficulty of um, uh, implementing it. And also the fact that firms will always be looking for workarounds and the probability that our allies would not get on board with it. Uh, would it make any difference uh, at all? And I have a, a great concern uh, about it. And it is also a little bit ironic that the US would be talking uh, seriously about export uh, uh, outbound investment screenings. It it's shows how far we've come, I would say. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to, to all three of our panelists for, for a very riveting discussion. And I'll turn it uh, back over to, to you all, to Jer Jeremy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Joseph, Margaret. Thank uh, you, Matt. And Thomas, thank you. That was- Fellow panelist. Thank you all. That was a fascinating and wide ranging look into the laws and regulations and politics and technologies and trade flows that are gonna shape our future in the next uh, few weeks and months, but also in, in the coming years and decades. So thank you again for an excellent panel. Now I'd like, like now to give a quick shout out to everyone at our live watch parties in New York, Washington, DC, and also a special shout out for you, London. Thank you. Um, now, our next panel is going to be moderated by Sam Sachs. Uh, it's about tech and energy, sponsored by Haiti Global. Uh, quick intro to Sam, uh, in case you don't know who she is. She's Cybersecurity Policy and China Digital Economy Fellow at the Think Tank New America. Her Research focuses on emerging information and communication technology policies globally and particularly in China. She's worked on uh, Chinese technology policies uh, and related issues for more than a decade within the US government and also in the private sector. She's a senior fellow at Yale Law School's Paul Tsai China Center. And we've also had her as a guest on the Seneca podcast and also a contributing writer at the China Project many times too. Um, so welcome, Sam. But before I hand over to you, uh, let's watch a quick intro video. Okay, Sam, I hope you liked that uh, uh, nice little video. Over to you. Thank you, Jeremy, for the kind introduction. Um, I'm excited to be on the panel tonight. It is very timely, and we have a great lineup of speakers. Catherine Pan is a partner at Dorsey & Whitney, um, where she's the corporate group head of the New York offices and a chair of the U.S.-China practice group. Jerry Wong is founder and CEO of Hi2 Global, an investment as a service global asset allocation platform. And my longtime friend, Paul Triolo, is senior vice president for China and technology policy at Albright Stonebridge Group and Denton's Global advisors. Um, welcome, everyone. So the, I, I heard the last few minutes of the trade panel, which ended up being sort of a technology panel. And I think in some ways, this is very telling because technology seems to run through every topic these days. Um, but I think we're going to dive deeper on some of those issues, particularly because I think coming out of last month, we saw a watershed new export control package. Um, and I want to ask if we can begin with Paul to just set the stage here, because the October 7th export control package came after several years of a steady drumbeat of measures around um, putting in place new guardrails in the tech space. And yet, this one came with a sort of direness to it. I think a lot of people thought this is a watershed moment. This is a turning point. Um, Paul, do you agree with that? What is different about what just happened, one? And two, I think that there's a kind of debate playing out that I want to sort of put in context here, which is 
From some people in the administration, I have heard this is intended to be a scalpel. They, these new controls are focused on the most advanced technical specifications. The goal was not to disrupt global semiconductor supply chains. And yet, from others, I've heard this is going to send a signal that the U.S. government actually doesn't want to just target military end use in China, but actually wants to freeze China in a way that will fundamentally cripple the future of its digital economy. So how should we look at this? Thanks, Sam, and uh, great question. And yes, I thought the last panel was going to do trade, but everybody wants to talk export controls these days. And part of it is because there's something in it for everybody in the in the smorgasbord of, of uh, issues that were actually part of that package. It wasn't just one thing. It was about seven different things going on. But I think it's important to just quickly step back and, and give a you know give the context of that of those controls because you know we we waited um, during the Biden administration for some uh, more clear statement for example on the China strategy and when we finally got that in May from Secretary Blinken he put technology at the center of the relationship um, I think uh, kind of unusually and then in, in the national security strategy that came out. I think ironically on the same day as the uh, October 7th was that export control package. Um, again, technology was sort of front and center. Um, even though China wasn't mentioned, it was clearly all over the place in the document. Um, and so I think the Biden administration in, in some ways has, has been continuing some of the, the policies of, of the Trump era where, where we did see technology and trade sort of mingle. The trade talks were mostly about technology, right? Market access, uh, subsidies, Force technology transfer, um, so less about trade and more about about uh, technology. Um, and then when we saw the Biden administration continuing things like export controls and and lists of company, Chinese companies, um, and um, you know it's, it's continuing to to uh, debate whether to ban TikTok, <laughs> for example, with the Chinese social media company. So that so the, a lot of uh, technology has has been has been certainly high on the agenda here now. The, um, the thing that's different, I think, leading up to these October 7th controls are some of the, finally, some of the statements we're seeing from senior officials in administration about what the goal of some of this stuff is. So um, Tom Christensen mentioned in the last panel, um, yes, it's about military modernization at one level. But I think you saw um, uh, some really important statements to note just quickly, but that led up to the October 7th um, what we, we call uh, in the industry, the October 7th surprise. Um, and we had Jake Sullivan, for example, in, in mid-September, you know, forcefully justifying the need for uh, new thinking and, and a broader action to protect our technology advantages. So he talked about the need to get away from sli a sliding scale of keeping China so many generations behind and sort of establishing an absolute <laughs> advantage. And of course, that's what the October 7th controls, one part of them did. They they sort of tried to try to set a, a, a level of technology that that essentially China can't advance beyond, <laughs> um, at least using U.S. technology, right? Um, so he and he said that um, you know this relative, so no more relative advantage, but sort of an absolute advantage. And then we also had him talk about this idea of um, a small yard and high fence, and say basically the U.S. is now implementing through these controls and other controls to come a small yard high fence. And we can talk about whether that analogy makes sense. The semiconductor industry, for example, is a global industry. And so the yard is pretty big to begin with. Um, and then fourth, we had, finally, we had um, Undersecretary of State Alan Estevez um, in late uh, um, uh, October talk about, in response to questions about the export control uh, package, basically say that, hey, you know, national security trumps economic security. And regardless of the consequences, right? So one thing the last panel didn't mention, for example, um, and rightly focusing on China was the impact on the US industry, for example, and the, and the potential loss of revenue <laughs> um, that's that's pretty significant for, for US industry. But basically Estevez was saying, hey, you know, national security trumps economic security um, and outweighs business interests uh, of specific semiconductor companies. Uh, it, it, and so that's an important context, I think, for the controls. And so then, as we think about specifically the controls, you know, there was all sorts of stuff in there. Um, there were at least five or six or seven different things that were put into the same package, right? That came from different different sources. So yes, the 
the controls on high-end uh, chips, uh, GPUs, uh, are sort of a continuation of uh, efforts largely driven by the Dep Department of Defense to, to limit China's ability to develop high performance computers to model weapon systems. Um, and the interesting wrinkle there was AI because AI, as Tom, as Tom very well rightly noted, is sort of this, it's, it's not a particular action the Chinese government has taken. Arguably on the high performance computing side, yes, the Chinese government has to use high performance computers to design hypersonic glide vehicles, which which are, are which pose some kind of a you know a threat to U.S. U.S. Uh, national security and and could be used in the, in the Taiwan conflict, for example. But AI is a little bit different because AI is, you know, it's used to do a lot of different things. Um, and so that was a little bit of a new wrinkle, adding in the AI res the restrictions um, specifically on these um, chips from Nvidia and AMD that are that are so critical for for um, AI a AI training and those. Almost automatically, if there's going to be a ban on those, for example, has a bigger, it's, it's a much bigger yard because those are used in data centers and they're used for, you know, drug discovery and for a whole host of non-military um, and uses in China. And so already we're seeing all sorts of ways to try to get around those controls, you know, designing chips that are, have lower thresholds uh, and capacities. The other really important piece was the semiconductor equipment, and that's a complicated issue around logic chips and around uh, memory. The big, one of the big surprises, though, was the inclusion of memory in the in the equation because uh, you know people can understand an, an AI chip or a high performance chip is going to be uh, of concern, but memory is a commodity. It's it's very much different than than logic. Um, and a whole different commercial uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, you know game, and so but and also it immediately dragged in foreign companies, foreign multinationals in China manufacturing memory, which are considerable uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, proportion of global output. So SK Hynix and Samsung, for example, uh, are big players there. So inadvertently, so the I think I think Thomas so somebody somebody mentioned that they thought that these were sort of well thought out export controls were attempting to be limited, but the problem was. They forgot that the, somebody forgot <laughs> that um, that about these foreign companies manufacturing memory in China, and so we were hours away from those companies having to also abide by the controls, which would have disrupted significantly, for example, the, the global memory market. Because um, both in DRAM and NAND, those foreign nationals in, in China are actually multi, uh, uh, responsible for a much bigger proportion of the global market than Chinese companies that are in those spaces, like YMTC. And CXMT. So again, sort of an un that, the industry was caught by surprise um, by that, um, and and that ca could nearly caused a major unintended consequence that was saved when the Commerce Department issued this one-year reprieve um, to those foreign multinationals. Um, and but it's still a long-term uh, potential impact. So when I look at when I look at this quickly, uh, just in, in summary, I see that there's there there are three there's sort of a, a short-term, long, medium-term, and long-term impact of this. So the short-term impact is is that it essentially freezes YMTC, CXMT, which is their DRAM manufacturer, um, and SMIC, the leading foundry, at the at the current level, right? And it's unusual because usually export controls free free future acquisition of equipment, but by including the U.S. persons uh, restrictions in here, this impacts their ability to produce now using their existing equipment. And so all the U.S. toolmakers, for example, have to have to pull out all of their people from those facilities. And those companies are, have gone to Secretary Armando and said, we're, we're, about, we're losing $5 billion, by the way, in revenue from 2023 if these, these controls are, if there's no licensing around those US persons. And that's a, and they also, that, that's a translates right into things like headcount and R&D budgets, right? Because that's a huge amount of money. Even though in the big scheme of things for the industry, it's not a huge number, but for those individual companies, it's huge. So that's the short-term impact. And then the medium-term impact is the impact on foreign, foreign multinationals making memory, because really the, the sort of implicit part of these controls, in my view, is a sort of a signal to decouple. Like those companies, yes, we're going to give you a reprieve to manufacture for a few years, but you should be thinking about getting out of China. Um, uh, in that memory space. And so um, that's sort of the, and so those companies have to consider how do, how do they do that? They have sunk billions of dollars into investment in China in those sectors and they have to figure out over a long, you know, considerable period of time, how do they get out of there um, without losing that investment? And then finally, by freezing those Chinese companies at, at, at those levels on the GPU space and in the AI and high performance computing arena, you know, that's, gonna, that's not going to impact right away. We, we already heard on the last panel that, that there are workarounds, you know, NVIDIA is going to put out this 800, which is pretty capable. But over three to five years, as the technology moves forward and China's and Chinese companies sort of stuck at this level, it's a huge thing because AI is all is, in, is research intensive and you need the latest hardware to run the latest algorithms to really compete in that sector. And there's lots of 
other sectors that rely on that, like autonomous vehicles. Um, and as I, I know the drug discovery and a whole bunch of other things. So but there, that, that's a longer term impact. So let me stop there. There's a lot of other unintended consequences we can talk about with that. But I think um, the, the, there's certainly going to be more controls, which we can talk about in AI and um, biotechnology. Yeah. And no, other. I think that's I think that's a really good stage mm -hmm. setter. Catherine, how are you thinking about this? And particularly because your work really looks at the, you know, how do you see the impact on cross-border investment as well as on the global semiconductor and ICT and uh, even automotive um, industries? Sure. In parallel to the export control regime, the cross-border investment is impacted by something else that's called the CFIUS Review Committee of Foreign Investment in the U.S. Basically, this is a U.S. federal level multi-agency committee that has the jurisdiction to review foreign investment uh, in the United States. Um, in fact, um, almost uh, parallel to all these export control development, on September 15th, President Biden issued an executive order um, which directs the CFIUS to focus their national security review on five risk factors. And those include number one, supply chain safety and resilience, number two, U.S. technology leadership. So um, technology leadership and economic leadership are defined as national security now. Uh, number three, certain trends of concentrated investments in a certain sector by foreign investors. Number four, cybersecurity, including smart grid, election, and other critical infrastructure. And finally, uh, quit, uh, sensitive personal data of U.S. persons. So uh, the executive order lays out the five important sectors and five important um, factors that the president wants CFIUS to focus on in its review going forward. So export control and CFIUS uh, work together hand in hand. CFIUS review um, inbound investments. Export control governs US technology exportation and transfer outbound. So together they formed a, a shield to prevent um, Chinese companies from accessing US technologies, either by importing these technologies or by investing in domestic companies. Thank you. And Jerry, um, how are you thinking about what the impact of this would be on your area of expertise and tech investment opportunities in China, and particularly building on Catherine's idea of the complementary CFIUS export controls, and then we haven't talked about yet on this panel, the potential for an outbound uh, investment review process. What does this mean for the future? Is there such a thing anymore as U.S. limited partners investing in China VCs or Chinese limited partners investing in U.S. VCs? Is this going to be a thing of the future or a thing of the past? Well, yeah, first of all, uh, I want to agree with Paul and Catherine on their comments on the technology ban and the cross-border investments. I, I think the those technology ban has been very effective. Uh, for example, Huawei was number one in smartphones uh, in China and quickly dropped off the rank because of the technology chips ban. And also, this is the uh, this is what we call a uh, double-bladed uh, sword. So it cut both ways. It hurt the U.S. industries too. And, but it's very effective. But uh, it, it, interestingly, uh, the Chinese government seems to be uh, welcome this kind of gesture because it goes way back to like 50s and 60s uh, of the last century. The US was under ban of a former Soviet Union in terms of technology. And they see this as an external force to unify the whole country. Uh, that's when they developed you know, nuclear technology, rocket and satellites. So this is might be the moment, you know, Chinese government was sticking. Um, anyway, going back to the cross-border investment, definitely it, it is drying up. And uh, the US LPs, particularly with public attention, you know, the, the pension funds, endowments, and foundation of the world, uh, they stopped making uh, investments in, in, in China GPs. Actually, before uh, this, you know, uh, was in effect, and, uh, and uh, on the other side, uh, the Chinese advancement in, in the U.S. and uh, it has stopped. Uh, well, 
um, kind of limited uh, since uh, um, 2016. And when uh, Chinese government put a limit on the conglomerates like the Anbang, you know, Awanda, uh, Haihang of the world, uh, they limited investment into advanced technology such as biotech. Uh, it's no more real estate investment, no more sports teams, you know, no more movies investments in the U.S. anymore. And uh, now it's like U.S. is banning, um, particularly as Catherine mentioned, the CPUs has been examining those investments from China into advanced technology companies like AI and robotics. And uh, so, uh, as I said, um, it's a Chinese government won't let the other investment other than high tech. And the US investment won't allow high tech from China. So, well, there's still some from uh, individuals and in the family offices uh, outside of China, say like Hong Kong or Singapore or even Dubai. And those are indirect investments from, uh, those are Chinese monies too, but uh, you know, with no uh, government uh, connections. So I think there's still some, uh, but uh, it definitely is drying up uh, in uh, both ways, in the, into China or, or into US. So with this spate of measures across different pillars um, of policy and regulation in the United States, you know, we've talked a lot about the view from Washington how is this being perceived in Beijing? You know, I have heard anecdotally that the Chinese government is very upset, and this is seen as a massively escalatory move. We also know that even in the height of the Trump administration's actions against Huawei, including third country extraterritorial export controls, China had ample opportunity to retaliate. They unrolled, they had the unreliable NTT list, the anti-sanctions law, the MOFCOM blocking rule. And even when the lifeline of Huawei beyond the U.S. was at stake, they didn't use these tools. We're now coming out of a party Congress where there's immense economic pressure uh, at a moment when there's immense part, uh, economic pressure. What are we going to see in terms of a response from the Chinese government? And this opens up any, anyone who wants to jump in here. I'm happy to take a quick step at that since we have clients that ask us that question virtually every day. Um, so I think, as you point out, Sam, you know, there's the China, first of all, I think it's important to note that Beijing has been very sort of forbearant on this. There's a reluctance to further poison the business climate in China. And most of these tools, you know, have a negative consequence for China's economy or for China's trade relations or for the, for the business climate. And so they've been really careful to avoid rolling out these things like the unreliable analysts. So there are these sort of symmetric responses, one could argue, like the UEL, um, and the anti-foreign sanctions law. There's also some, I, I'm getting some initial signals that there could be uh, things like um, uh, playing with some um, uh, standards that would uh, that are sort of in draft form, for example, that could disadvantage US companies, although it's not clear if those are just sort of part of the regular, um, you know, the regular back and forth or whether they're, they, they might be sort of signs of some sort of retaliation. There are also, I'm hearing from various quarters in industry, things like concern about rare earths. That would be sort of an asymmetric response reaching outside the sort of the, the, the strictly tech sector, the ICT sector, uh, for, where China has some really advantages in terms of uh, Chinese company dominance of both rare earths, magnets, EV batteries and EV battery supply chains, right? But those are those are tricky to use as a, and weaponize because those are in many cases commodities. There are markets. The markets would react to those. You'd you'd force investment into other areas. So there's not a lot of good options here. But I think I agree with that. This this is really a different a different type of control, and it sort of hits it at some really key areas of, of that the that the that the party and government are focused on, like AI and high performance computing. Um, and so I think at one level, you almost need like a symbolic response to this, um, this more public. And then there'll probably be a whole series of things that we don't see publicly um, that will be sort of behind the scenes, you know, again, sort of targeting US companies in ways that are a little under the radar. Um, but I think this is gonna be a longer term uh, sort of response. It's not gonna be all, all at once. They're still digesting the impact after all. I mean, we're still digesting the impact of the export control package. They, they still are too. How, how hard is it gonna hit their companies? Um, but I think there will be a response that, that will probably come after the Biden C um, meet, uh, the summit next week um, in, in Bali at the G20. They'll wait for that. There's a, there's a sense that they wanna have some positive and constructive agenda for that. But after that, we'll probably see <laughs> Um, the, 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 at least the initial uh, stages of a reaction here. But again, I don't think it's going to be really 
major uh, and, and targeting major companies, U.S. companies in China. But it will it will be uh, there will probably be a comp public component of this that is at least pretty symbolic, although it may not be as hard hitting as it seems. Uh, and then there'll be these other things behind the scenes that, that that are rolled out over the next three to six months. Jerry or Catherine, do you want to chime in there? Sure. In the past, China was a lot more forceful in its retaliation against the smaller companies, uh, smaller countries. Uh, you saw uh, the, the trade war with um, Lithuania, right, and Australia. And China was a lot more restrained in its retaliation against a huge trade partner like United States. Um, China does have the tools that it needs to retaliate if it wants. For example, China has adopted its own anti-foreign sanction law and China has its own export control regime. China has data security law and state secrecy laws. All these laws can be adopted by the Chinese government to, to use against the multinationals and other American interests in China. Uh, and what's also interesting is um, a lot of us talked about export control and the October 7th um, policy shift. One thing we haven't talked about is the unverified list and the entity list. Uh, the, those both lists have been drastically expanded to cover more companies. More importantly, it's the first time that the United States government, BIS of Commerce, basically said Chinese government is not collaborating with us and therefore we're adding these additional companies to the unverified list because we cannot do our end use and end user inspections in China without the collaboration of the host country government. So yes, yeah, so it remains to be seen whether China will continue to cooperate with the US to allow the export control inspections to be carried out. That's another tool within China's two bag to use if they don't cooperate. The BIS has no way to um, exercise its inspection authority on the ground of China. I do yeah. think it's interesting that of all of those tools, they have been in place for a long time and they haven't been used yet. And so, you know, is the October package, is that enough of a trigger when we've had ample opportunity before um, I just find that interesting, right? And Jerry, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, um, uh, I'm, I'm great with the uh, cast training. China has been adopting a different approach. I mean, besides seeking allies from the one by one row countries, and, and it's also working with you no know, G20, for example, or with Germany. Germany runs the huge uh, surplus with China, you know, exporting machineries and you know, high tax. So uh, China is trying to form a, a kind of like a relationship and uh, exporting uh, rose advanced technology from Europe uh, other than the US. Try to you know uh, put the split within the, the G20 countries. Also Taiwan you know runs a hundred billion surplus with China uh, every year. So it's really difficult to separate. Um, but you know um, rose some Taiwanese company they're trying to build factories here in the US. You know, this is where it's gradually shifting. Uh, you know, the global supply chain was built over the past 30 years. You know, it's not going to break overnight. It's going to take another decade or so to, uh, you know, I mean, company adopting a China Plus strategy or you know, what we call ABC, anywhere but China strategy already. But it's going to take time. Um, I think China is handling more um, conservatively, you know, because they don't want to uh, fight wars or old friends. They're trying to seek allies. Uh, too. So uh, I think it, it is effective so far. Yeah, I'll just add quickly, Sam, that it's also, I think when we look for a response, it, it shouldn't necessarily all be punitive. They're already, of course, coming out of the party Congress. There's a lot of doubling down on, on investment in the semiconductor sector. Um, a lot of local <laughs> governments, Shenzhen and Shanghai are all, you know, have plans, announced plans for further investments in semiconductors. There's also been an attempt to assure the foreign business community um, that multinationals are still welcome in China and their investment is still welcome. So it's not all sort of, it's not all stick. It won't be sticks. It'll be a combination, I think, of carrots and sticks. There are other tools, though, that just quickly we haven't mentioned, things like SAMR's approval of mergers. There's actually a, a, one significant merger, I won't name the companies involved, um, that's up, that, 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 that has been through three of the steps, or two of, two of the three SAMR steps that will come up in December. And that's a fairly high profile 
uh, merger and acquisition that they could decide to reject or let the clock run out, for example. And so there are those kinds of things uh, also um, that that could we could be looking for in terms of um, tools they could use um, that would be retaliation uh, that are that is more sort of you know tit for tat. Um, so there's lots of tools on the table, that, and some of them are lower costs, of course. But as as both Jerry and and Catherine noted, there you know there are these things that are that are out there that they haven't used yet, um, and and they they could use them. But they even if they do use some of those 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 existing tools, I think they'll be very careful to to limit the impact um, because again everything you everything you, you did China would do would have a negative impact on on some of its other goals like the economy or uh, S and T development. So we've talked again a lot about what's coming out of Washington. Um, in the last few minutes of our panel, I want to just shift to developments in technology in China that actually have very little to do with the United States. How should we be thinking about the leadership's approach to tech policy? You know, coming now on it's been a we've sort of come full arc away from the enforcement surge on the large tech platforms. We're on the other side of the party congress. There's been signaling about the importance of the digital economy and the overall health of the economy. What are your thoughts about the government's approach as well to private sector and the tech space in China? Where are we there? Um, yeah, I, I think the technology uh, crackdown has been done. And uh, the most large technologies, they're not officially nationalized, but the uh, government has significant influence in those uh, platforms. Technology is critical, uh, you know, in this stage, what, we, what I call digital planning economy. So uh, the Chinese government tried to uh, enforce, uh, you know, from top down more central government control the society. Uh, those uh, digital technologies, for example, uh, the Chinese government is running digital RMB. And uh, those companies, they like Union Pay or Alipay or uh, WeChat Pay, are critical to exercise, you know, those kind of uh, uh, digital technologies. So government has to control those uh, platforms. And in, for he here, you know, uh, central bank trying to issue a uh, digital dollar, and uh, there's a lot of resistance and on the privacy issues, but there's no such thing in China. So, uh, so I think the technology. Uh, and have not monopoly and roles are, are over already. And same as uh, the financial holding companies, you know, the, the Anbang or, or, you know, Hai Hang of the world are, are dissembled. And uh, the license has been issued to the state-owned companies like Beijing Holdings, and, you know, and City Group. Um, so the next will be the real estate. So the largest one who are, um, you know, the private companies and, uh, and are, uh, will be gradually uh, nationalized too. So those critical industries and uh, uh, significant influence the, the national economy will gradually, you know, uh, become state-owned companies or state influence companies already. Catherine, do you have any thoughts there? Yeah, I think that when we in the in the Western media, when the tech crackdown was reported, tech was defined too narrowly. What they call the tech crackdown is not really what China thinks of as the core tech crackdown, because um, a lot of the Western reports focus on, you know, BATs, right? The um, platform technologies. And then Chinese government doesn't really care too much about those platform technology. They care about the hardcore technology, for example, electronic vehicle, right? EV technology, battery storage technology, AI, robotics, uh, quantum computing, aerospace, um, uh, renewable energy, smart grid, uh, agricultural technology, new materials, and biotech. China has never cracked down on these technologies. In fact, China has been supporting these industries through its domestic industrial policies, including tax incentives and government subsidies. The United States is just waking up and catching up. Uh, I think two laws that got passed recently in the US are very important. One is the Inflation Reduction Act, which will have a huge impact on the energy sector, EV sector, uh, climate tech, renewable energy, uh, among with many other sectors. And the Chips and Science Act will have very broad impact beyond just semiconductors. It's chips and science rather than just chips act. So the US is catching up in terms of domestic industrial policies and tax incentives and subsidies. 
but China is ahead in terms of those industrial policies. Paul, do you have any thoughts on the direction of tech policy in China? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's tricky coming out of the 20th Party Congress, of course, the feeling that the industry got in the markets initially reacted badly because the sense was that there would be more emphasis on state-owned enterprises and the private sector you know, might not be as, as favored. But I think that's a, that's a mistake. I think the new team in place, uh, probably the new premier will be Li Qiang from Shanghai. He was instrumental in getting Tesla there and then uh, and, and uh, opening the star market, which is another really important, uh, you know, the S&T market in, in Shanghai, which has been a big, a big emphasis. So I think that the new team is, is not as necessarily market unfriendly or private sector unfriendly as, as, as for, at first glance. I think the really critical thing will be who will replace somebody like Liu He, who was this very critical player who, you know, sort of tried to try to reassure the private sector in, in certain instances, plus reassure global markets um, that things were going in a good direction. So I think it'll be important to see who who emerges in that role. Huli Fung maybe maybe has, has already sort of taken a step in that direction. Um, and so I think that you know going forward that that that, that, the, that with the tech rectification thing a campaign seeming to wind down. Yes, there'll be the, there'll be continue to be this emphasis on hard and core technologies like semiconductors and those other areas. But there's also other areas where there's a lot of activity like the metaverse. Everybody, every town and every, every municipality now has a metaverse plan. Um, virtual reality is is, is is an area where there's a lot of growth. Blockchain um, is, is critical. And I think as Catherine rightly notes, I mean, the battery technology is, is an area where China isn't really dependent on US technology. So you have a, a global leader like CATL, for, for example, which has about 36% of the global EV battery market, considering also expanding into the US. Um, but they put off, for example, an announcement after the Pelosi visit to Taiwan in August. But you know, Chinese bat the top 15 of the top 20 battery companies in the world are Chinese, 15 of the top 20. So they really dominate that, plus all of the supply chains for all for those batteries are all also dominated to a huge degree by Chinese companies, whether it's graphite or nickel um, or lithium. And so that's going to be a really important area as the U.S. tries to, to reduce its dependence on China for those areas through the IRA. But Chinese companies are really, uh, really quite innovative in that space and, and really uh, dominate to, to agree it's going to be really hard for the U.S. to have a green tech revolution without finding some accommodation with China. And my hope is that coming out of the Biden C meeting, if the climate change talks can be um, uh, restarted, for example, that there'll be a, that that's an area for more collaboration because I don't see any way for the U.S. to to reproduce those particular supply chains, for example, in the U.S. anytime soon because uh, China has invested strategically so much in that in that sector, and the companies they that have been created are really innovative, like CTL. In the three minutes we have left, I want to zoom out further beyond the bilateral relationship, and I think the. Inflation Reduction Act is actually key here because this is an area where U.S. allies, frankly, felt like they got screwed. And there are a number of sort of other areas where there's allies and partners of the U.S. are not necessarily on board with this agenda in terms of China and the tax base. So whether it's beyond just the export controls itself, those were unilateral. But beyond that, how are allies and partners in Europe, in Asia, in other parts of the world looking at this? I know this is two minutes left to talk about this topic, but is the U.S. going it alone here in its efforts to curb China's technology development? Great question, Sam. Just real quick. Yeah, you're exactly right on the export controls. Unilateral. So there's intense negotiations right now with the Netherlands and with um, Japan to try to get some alignment on those controls. But it's really complicated because those countries have very different export control systems. Um, it's not that easy to transfer, transpose all of those, the many regulations that were in the in that October 7th package into national law. So Gina Raimondo actually just last week said it's going to take six to nine months to get agreement on that. After, Which I've even heard skepticism of that right. not, well, not that that's not going right. to happen in six to nine months. That's probably very optimistic, although it's more realistic than some other U.S. officials were saying earlier that it was going to be sort of a slam dunk. And so that's going to be really tough. But but when you throw in the IRA. Um, and which is also, uh, you know, not made people in Europe and South Korea and Japan and other places unhappy um, with that. The question is, can those things kind of be separated out? <laughs> um, or is there the sense that the U.S. is, is throwing in place these unilateral uh, protectionist uh, sort of measures um, that, that, are, that are not good? I mean, I, I've talked to people in the Netherlands, Japan, and the reaction there is, why would any country do this to their industry 
um, you know, with, 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 with for so little gain, for example, there's not a sense and there's not the same kind of national security concerns that, that have driven some of the US control. So it's going to be a really the next six to nine months, I think, uh, in places like the EU, US TTC, the Trade and Technology Council and the Quad and other places um, where some of these things are discussed, it's going to be a really more lively debate in 2023 over how to align on some of these things. Or not. Jerry or Catherine, any closing thoughts on that or anything else in our last minute? Right. Intense negotiations with European and Asian trade partners, um, exchange of benefits uh, for cooperation. So under Inflation Reduction Act, uh, China is a foreign country of concern. A lot of Chinese entities are foreign entities of concern. By definition, they are not eligible for a lot of the um, tax incentives for the EV and EV battery uh, manufacturing. Uh, but um, US has the room to create exclusion for Korean companies, Taiwanese companies, and Dutch companies. Uh, and I wonder what they're going to ask in exchange for allowing these countries and these companies benefits under both RLA and the CHIPS Act, perhaps tip for coal would be a multilateral enforcement of the export control. It has happened in the past. Export control is a unilateral and a multilateral effort. There are four you know, international treaties and anywhere from 35 to 50 different countries are members of these export control treaties. So intense negotiations behind the doors. We are at time, so I'm going to have to end the panel, but I want to thank Catherine, Jerry, and Paul for a great discussion. So much more to talk about here. Thanks, Sam, and thanks um, to, every, to all the hosts and panelists. Okay. Sam, uh, Paul, uh, Jerry, and Catherine, um, when the chips are down, we can turn to you for highly informed views and real depth of expertise in technology policy, trade, and business between the US and China and beyond. Uh, and if I may make one simplistic takeaway from the panel, nobody is really on board with a lot of stuff going on around the world. Our next panel is called Future Strategies, uh, sponsored by El Cassison. The moderator, Lizzie Lee, you may know her as host of Live with Lizzie Lee at the China Project. Lizzie graduated from MIT's PhD program in economics prior to joining the New York-based independent Chinese media outlet, Wall Street TV. And now at the China Project, we are delighted to call her a colleague with her show in which she interviews a wide range of the most knowledgeable people for analysis of China's heady brew of business, technology, and politics. Before I hand over to Lizzie, let's watch a quick visual introduction to the panel. Okay, Lizzie, over to you. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, our audience. Hello, and welcome to Strategies for the Future panel of this year's Next China Conference. I am Lizzie, moderator for this session, come to you live from New York. Today on the program, we have an all-star panel of uh, veteran investors and China analysts. We have Arthur Kruber, uh, founding partner of Gavacal. Gavacal produces market-leading investment research and insights on global macro trends and markets and on China's economy uh, in particular. We also have Gary Rishal, uh, founding managing partner of Teaming Ventures Partner. Uh, Gary launched Teaming Ventures in Shanghai mm -hmm. back in 2006 and Teaming invests in uh, technology and consumer and healthcare for the most part. Now, Teaming has over 9.4 billion USD in capital raised. And finally, we have Michael Chu, global co-CEO of L. Catterton, sponsor of this panel session. Michael is a global co-CEO of L. Catterton, a firm he founded back in 19. 
89. L. Caterton is the largest consumer-focused private equity firm in the world, operating through seven distinct fund platforms. And now L. Caterton covers close to 90% of the global GDP. Thank you so much for joining me today, our stellar panelists. So the topic of the day is strategies for the future. As we know, um, China is grappling with a host of internal and external challenges. So um, I'm going to start with the present challenge. What are the prospects for an economic turnaround in the coming month? Specifically, China's economic walls seems to be deepened. Do you expect to see any course corrections on COVID restrictions, property market cleanup, or the tech sector's regulatory crackdown during the past few years? I'm going to start with you, uh, Arthur. Yeah, thank you. And I'm pleased to be here. Uh, short answer is no. I don't see much uh, shift. Uh, COVID policies are clearly restrained by the government's concern that if they opened up the way other countries have, that there would just be unbearable stress on their somewhat rickety healthcare system. Uh, so I think we have to get through a winter. We have to get through the completion of the political cycle with the next uh, National People's Congress. And we probably have to see somewhat better vaccines and therapeutics before we start to see substantial shifts in that. So China will be living with some degree of COVID restrictions for most of next year. Uh, property policy, I think similar, the government is trying to get ahead of a secular slowdown in the rate of urbanization, which is going to lead to a slowdown in the demand for housing. So they're trying to squeeze out a bubble uh, before it gets uh, too bad. And I think there's, there's more that they need to do there. Uh, I think the key point, though, I would make is that a lot of the things that are negative about the Chinese economy right now are created by these policies. And so once these policies exit the stage, which they eventually will, just probably not early next year, uh, there is potential for significant rebound in, in economic activity. So broadly speaking, I, I don't have a super optimistic view for China's economy over the next 12 months, but I also think that some of the current market negativity is overdone. Thank you, Arthur. And just to follow up on your point, um, much of China's growth slump is triggered by a government policy. I wanted to talk a little more about property market. As you know, Evergrande is the latest casualty of Beijing's effort to, to uh, you know, bring the, the country's debt under some sort of a control. Do you think the current policies can fix the structural problems in the property market um, and yes, potentially the I... foundation for the future? Yeah, I think broadly they can. I mean, I think the, the basic issue is that for the last 20 years, China's urban population has grown by about 20 million people a year. And if you project out uh, to the end of the decade under pretty much any scenario that anyone has done, this is going to fall substantially to somewhere between 10 and 15 million people a year. And so there's no way that that can happen without a significant slowdown in, in underlying property demand. And so what the government is saying is, as long as there was this enormous annual increase in urban population, property developers could afford to have a heavily indebted, heavily, heavily leveraged business model because there was always more demand down the road. Now they can't afford to have it. So I think the policy in general is appropriate. The way that it's being imposed, you know, has a lot of problems with it. And they've, I think, probably caused, you know, more chaos than is necessary. Um, but fundamentally, I, I think it's a, a necessary strategy for shifting resources in the Chinese economy away from um, uh, property and infrastructure and into uh, high value uh, activities such as uh, manufacturing. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Arthur. Uh, I wanted to bring to the attention of our audience a piece of statistics that just, um, you know, uh, that I just read. This is from the U.S. China Business Council's uh, 2022 members survey, which is conducted in a summer of this year. It found 96% of respondents who have experienced negative impacts on their China business because of con uh, COVID control related measures. And as, sh as you know, uh, just this August, uh, this the, the end of August, there was some speculation that policymakers are going to make preparations for uh, gradually exiting the uh, the current stringent COVID zero policy in Chinese stocks list in Hong Kong immediately increased by seven percentage point. So, so Michael, what's your read on the current COVID restriction policies? What will be the trajectory of post uh, post COVID consumption recovery in China and the rest of the world? 
Yeah, no, uh, let, let me add my uh, welcome to everyone as well. Um, I actually totally agree with Arthur's comments um, uh, on, on, on real estate. And these things are all sort of tied together, as, as you can imagine. Um, the, the, on, on, on COVID, the, uh, there's just no way they're going to walk back you know, the current uh, direction of, of, the, of, of their policy for all, all the reasons that Arthur, Arthur articulated. Um, with that said, the, look at the Chinese government knows that the savings rate uh, as a result of, of the COVID policies have shot up near 40%, which is not a good thing from a China standpoint because they really need uh, consumption to drive overall economic growth. And when you have high savings rate because of COVID policies that are overly restrictive, the, uh, that is obviously problematic in the long term. Um, with that said, look at they are now allowing BioNTech from Germany to come in for, for non-Chinese citizens. They've now done over 30 you know, iterations of their own Sinovac you know, vaccine. Uh, so they are working like heck to try to find a way to uh, you know, open up the economy you know, within the guardrails that, they, that they've imposed. I think everyone probably may have seen uh, the speculative stock market rise of last week when there was a screenshot of a rumor of somebody just musing about, you know, one of the uh, chief uh, politicians, you know, putting together a committee to think about a reopening. So on a speech, what turned out to be a false rumor, uh, you saw the stock market, you know, rally almost $500 billion dollars you know, in market cap, purely on the rumor. So look at there, what it says to me is that there's a lot of money on the sidelines. It's waiting to come in. You know, the issue economically for the, for the economy and for investments broadly is nobody knows how to price risk, okay? That's that, at the end of the day, what we do. And when you have uncertainty, it's impossible to know how to price it. And uh, that's, that's sort of what you're seeing. So when COVID sort of ameliorates as it will, um, over some period of time, and as the economy opens, as it will, you're going to see, without undoubtedly, a, a spike in in uh, consumption. It, uh, there'll be some leveling off, but you'll see a dramatic spike in consumption and uh, decrease in savings, which is exactly what they need to do. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Michael. Gary, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, you once said that the Chinese entrepreneurs have a you can't kill me attitude toward the government and toward anybody, uh, actually. Is that still true? Can they survive Beijing's sweeping crackdown for the past few years? Or would you say those regulatory changes have been uh, largely positive for the country's economic future? Oh, good morning, everyone, or good evening, everyone. Um, Singapore is morning then. Um, I think the entrepreneurs, the entrepreneurial spirit is still very alive and well, and the depth of the of the talent pool continues to evolve you know, very nicely in China. Um, I think the government, and people get confused. What did they actually crack down on? I think that um, in the last panel there was a discussion in terms of what by Catherine in terms of what hadn't really been criticized or what hadn't been cracked down. I think that's largely the important story. Um, when you look at the A-share listings thus far year to date, um, the Shanghai star market has seven times the NASDAQ um, in terms of money raised. Um, that's a good thing for the entrepreneurial community because that's largely where the IPOs will wind up being. And you get confused about where China is as opposed to where it's going. There's a legitimate question on where it's going. But when you look at the scale of the market, you look at the quality of the entrepreneurs, you look at the, the R&D innovation talent, um, and then you look at the areas where I think there are in interesting investment opportunities going forward. Um, it's a pretty good story. Um, the, you know, Arthur made a really critical point, which is COVID, some of the property policies, some of the cracking, these are all self-inflicted wounds. So when, when China quits hurting itself, you will see a rebound, but at the core level of where the where the startup entrepreneurs are, no one's waking up in the morning and saying, I'm not gonna start this company today because of Xi Jinping. Right, fantastic. Thank you so much, Gary. So the elephant in the room really is Chinese politics. And if, if you remember after China's 20th party Congress, there was a global sell-off of Chinese stocks. It seems to be there's this um, perception among investors that uh, China's 
lauded uh, economic performance is going to take a backseat to something like ideology control and national security concerns in the years to follow. Is that an, accu an accurate assessment? And what do you think is the implication of the 20th Party Congress personnel reshuffle in particular on the economy? Uh, I'm going to start with Arthur. Yeah, I, my view on this is that the concerns about the impact of more centralized, essentially one person rule in China are very reasonable on a medium to long term time horizon. I think they're probably overstated in the short run. Um, and my main reason for thinking this is that I think one of the difficulties that China's had over the last several years was that Xi Jinping was not comfortable with certain members of his Politburo and his standing committee, Li Keqiang in particular, was seen as a political rival. And so it was very important for him to undercut these people and make it difficult for them to do their jobs. That is no longer the case. Uh, and as I think uh, uh, Paul Triolo uh, pointed on the last panel, Li Chang, the, uh, the premier, has significant economic experience in Shanghai, generally considered to be you know, pretty pragmatic, understanding of business needs, et cetera. Uh, and more importantly, he has the trust of Xi Jinping, so he probably will have a little bit more room to maneuver than, than his predecessor. So I think in the short run, we are likely to be surprised by the degree of pragmatism that we see coming out of this government. Because remember, Xi Jinping has all kinds of concerns. Some are ideological and some have to do with great power aspirations, et cetera. But for him to achieve his aims, China's economy does have to keep growing. Uh, and he may have a little bit different view as, as to how you manage that growth than, than prior leaders. But the growth objective is still uh, pretty significant. And I think that in the short run, um, the, the team that has been appointed is going to be competent to manage that. I think if you project out five or 10 years, however, there is a, a real legitimate concern that if Xi Jinping just continues to run it and, and things continue to be more and more centralized in one person, you know, the track record of regimes like that is not good. Um, so on that time horizon, I, I would have concerns. But as we look out over the next few years, um, I think that the the likelihood is that China will continue to be managed in a, in a relatively pragmatic and basically growth friendly way. Yeah, I see. Michael, uh, so anything to add on this point? How will Chinese leader make major decisions about the country's economic direction for the next five years and beyond? You know, I think five years, I agree with Gary, is hard to, I think it's hard for anybody to look out. You know, clearly the, the people we talk to, uh, there is um, a strong belief that China's leaders will be super pragmatic over the coming, you know, short term. Uh, that's driven by as much by necessity as by policy. Um, I think folks know that uh, that almost 60, 70 percent of China's increase in GDP has come from uh, increased consumption. Um, and, and so they need to stimulate that and um, and they need to continue to stimulate, you know, investment and investment won't really happen from folks like ourselves and others uh, until we see, you know, a relaxation of COVID policy um, there. Uh, you know, a lot of people want to see the Taiwan rhetoric tone sort of softening, you know, a bit, which is actually happening. Um, there has to be some capital market relaxation regarding US IPO paths, which is actually happening. Um, there's probably some stimulus that's required by the government, which we hear is sort of in the works. So so the people that we talk to in the government um, and, and corroborated by others, even more in the know, you know, would suggest that the Chinese government is acutely aware of the levers it needs to pull on and is taking action sort of as we speak in the next six months to a year will be telling. Um, look at the, the China has, for, you, you know, forever, you know, been a highly regulated uh, country and people made money when they kind of invest behind the tailwind of those regulations. I think the big mistake in the West is that when China adopted more open capital markets and capitalist policies uh, to create new companies, attract capital. But I think a lot of people in the West 
conflated that with an embrace of democratic principles, right? Which was never in the cards, right? Mm -hmm. And I think what you saw play out over the last, you know, year or two was a stark reminder that, you know, China's not going to embrace democratic principles. It may embrace elements of cap open market capitalism, um, but uh, certainly not, not at the expense of, of maintaining sort of a high control. Um, so look, at, I think the next six to 12 months will be very telling. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Michael. Gary, I'm going to turn to you. So uh, for, for healthcare in particular, will foreign capital still be welcome in, in China? Um, what areas are you focusing on now for new investments in China, if at all? Uh, Gary, I think you're 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 uh, you're you're muted now. Uh, so, uh, Gary, yes. your your mic is muted. Sorry, Gary. Yep. Now it's open. Okay. Yeah. Someone, someone out there. Anyway, try not to touch it. I guess. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about healthcare, and then I'll talk a little bit about technology as well. So on healthcare specifically there's still a massive opportunity to invest in the infrastructure build out in China. So they're short about 4 million doctors today. They're short about 7 million nurses. They're short somewhere on the order of half a million uh, you know, clinics. They still have not broadly distributed the healthcare provisioning, uh, healthcare service side of the business. And so that's gonna continue over the next decade. Um, there's a very healthy ecosystem in terms of biotech, diagnostics, devices, um, and services that continues to be very investable. Um, cell therapy, Chinese companies, especially in CAR-T area, are pretty much at world standard at this point. Uh, there are startups that are doing things that are not being done uh, globally outside of China. Gene editing, personalized medicine, that's going to be another area, and neural. So on the healthcare side, one would look at that. On the tech side, you have to look at, you know, in semiconductors, when I mentioned the starboard earlier, there are 432 listings on the starboard. 84 are related to semiconductors. So that is a statement in terms of both the investability on the front end, but also the liquidity opportunity on the back end. Um, intelligent manufacturing is only seven, intelligent manufacturing as, it, as defined by um, the uh, standard bodies, you only have 7% penetration in China of intelligent manufacturing today. That's clearly given the scale of China's manufacturing base gonna be something that's very investable. Um, automobiles, um, EV, China is now over 50% of the global EV market and 60% are homegrown brands. So this is not Tesla. 60% of China's massive EV infrastructure is now homegrown brands and it's growing very, very quickly. Um, so in the first half, 2.6 million EV units um, were sold in China. So over 20% penetration within the domestic market. So that also remains very investable. And then you have the software area. Um, there is no question the Chinese government does not want foreign software populating its large state-owned enterprises and the large uh, different market-driven uh, you know, businesses in the country. So SaaS, cloud, and infrastructure um, will remain, if you're investing in China for China, will wind up being a very, very strong area for decades to come. Um, if you look at the global market today, top 100 software companies, there are two Chinese companies in that list. That is going to change. And so you can look at these different categories over a broad basis, and you can decide for yourself if the leading company in China, where would that fit on the global, uh, on the global scale, if you will. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Gary. So after we talk about opportunities, let's talk about risk for a little bit. There's a lot of concern in rising tensions between Beijing and, and Washington. Um, ju just to keep things in perspective a little bit, there's a glimmer of hope. In the past uh, few weeks, we heard the news that uh, U.S. inspectors actually completed on-site uh, inspections. So the delisting rig of, of Chinese ADRs uh, diminished, uh, at least on the margin. And uh, this month, uh, U.S. President Biden and the Chinese President Xi Jinping will aim to meet at the G20 summit in Bali. Uh, so how should investors think about the geopolitical headwinds of U.S.-China relations and what should they do? Um, Michael, any thoughts on that? You know, like I said before, the um, uh, and I think there's a difference between public and private investors. So that's an important sort of distinction here. The public guys that I, I talk to, hedge fund, long only, et cetera, look at they are for the most part risk off. And the which is, and you see that in the trading volumes, et cetera. 
uh, because at the end of the day, they don't know how to price risk. They see the world, they see the China policies being super risky, and they're going to wait for some data. And I, I was with a very, very successful, smart uh, hedge fund investor who basically just says, I don't need to capture the entire run up in the market. I can I can let five or eight percent percentage points run before I jump in. And the, so there's no there's no premium for me to sort of be first. And, and I think that that sentiment is actually pretty well established, which is why you'll see a lag, uh, most likely, you know, as and, until they see real tangible evidence of constructive policy uh, of the like that I mentioned earlier. Your, your talk about being more constructive on IPOs and, and, and access to capital markets, I think is these are just small steps, by the way. I think in contrast to that, the 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 private markets, um, you know, are structurally oriented to put capital out because they have a time clock on their capital. Um, so they're probably a bit more risk on and and uh, we're certainly risk on in our capital. We're putting we're, we're extremely active in China, both in our RMB fund and U.S. dollar fund. We're not alone. Um, uh, I think we're seeing a lot of we're seeing lots of. Of, of strategic capital coming into China, even now, by the way, some of the large multinationals putting capital in. Um, there's a whole reason for that that's, that we can talk about later. But the, the um, so look at, I, I think, I think it's a difference between public and, and private, but at the end of the day, it all is around, you know, how do you price risk? Fantastic. And Arthur, help us understand how to price risks and how to think about geopolitical tensions for investors. Uh, yeah, well, it's really very difficult to price risk. So if Michael can, uh, you know, give me a primer afterwards, I'd be glad to hear it. And I, you know, I think the the problem is that there is uh, just a high degree of not just risk that you can quantify, but real uncertainty about how things are going to play out. And so a couple of examples here. Uh, one is uh, there have been discussions in the U.S. about putting some kinds of restrictions on uh, outbound capital flows to China, either by industrial companies that want to make direct investments or by venture capital companies um, that want to fund startups. Um, uh, there's a lot of momentum behind this in Congress. I think with the Republican House of Representatives, this momentum is likely to grow. Uh, the Biden administration has been talking pretty seriously about an executive order that would impose some kind of at least monitoring requirement on or disclosure requirement on um, uh, venture capital firms that want to invest in Chinese technology sectors. So I think it's pretty likely, frankly, that we will get some kind of moves, regulatory moves by the US to, to constrict financial flows to China, either through a, an approval requirement, which would be quite difficult to administer, or through a disclosure requirement, which would I think create a lot of disincentives uh, for uh, entities such as public university pension, uh, public university endowments, and and pension funds that have a very big public face. We create a disincentive for them to to move additional money into China. So there, I think there is a risk there, uh, and there's also a risk around just the the the, the more fevered temperature of rhetoric around China that, again, I think we are likely to see in the in the coming years, um, partly because of, a, of the transition to Republican Congress. Uh, and I think this could, you know, accelerate um, in the next presidential cycle as well. So I think a key will be um, whether the Biden administration can be successful in gaining a bit more control of the narrative and sort of setting out clear boundaries about what kinds of investments are acceptable, what kinds are not. Um, we already see, um, just in, in terms of the high level stuff, we see a real range. So there are these very publicized restrictions on semiconductor controls. At the same time, um, American LNG companies have been signing long-term contracts with China, which will in a few years make China US the number two supplier of natural gas to China. And there, there's not a big uh, political controversy about that. Um, so I think real is, realistically, even if you think it's good policy for the US to try and restrict certain kinds of technology flows to China, this needs to be done in a fairly precise way. Uh, but right now, I think the, the one of the 
things that investors are responding to is the fact that the rhetoric is very overheated, China is bad in all ways, uh, and they're just not sure how that is going to play out in terms of the ability, particularly of large institutional pools of capital to allocate to even the private investors that Michael is talking about. Fantastic. And finally, uh, Gary, please help us understand how the geopolitics will factor into the investors' decisions in China, either on the grounds or uh, from overseas. It's interesting, given what Arthur just said, the, the real risk to an investor in China is from the U.S., not from China. And so when you're looking at the risk of investing in China, the entrepreneurial ecosystem is there, the liquidity ecosystem is there, the risk is time. Because as the U.S. becomes more restrictive on technology moving to China, then there will it will clearly impact how long certain products, certain technologies take to develop in China. And on the back end, domestic listings have a longer require a longer holding requirement, more more onerous distribution requirements than a Nasdaq or perhaps a Hong Kong listing would have. So, from a policy perspective, the capital, the investment in China right now. I think it's actually pretty well defined in terms of where the opportunities are. And you're not going to have a lot of question about leadership. You're not going to have a lot of question about, about political control. So from that standpoint, a lot of the uncertainty has been eliminated over the course of the last month. Um, but now we'll have to see where the rhetoric goes and what really does become policy. I would, I would take one issue with the idea that you're going to be able to easily restrict endowment or large pension money going into China. All that money can be substituted. When Qi Ming raised his last fund, if someone had said you can't take any endowment money, there was no shortage of money from the Middle East, from sovereign wealth funds, from high net worth families in Europe. And Americans lose track of the fact that it's no longer American money. A dollar is a dollar. And the people deploying the money in China in startups are Chinese. And so it's a it's kind of this weird thing where there's still some idea in the U.S. government that an American dollar carries more value than a dollar from somewhere else. It doesn't. Fantastic. Thank you so much for all your insights. Sorry. Well, well, all I would add, I know we're running out of time, is as you listen to the narrative that's being discussed is about fear, uncertainty, how to price risk, you know, people going risk off. And we should just be reminded that you know, there are smart people, you know, Warren Buffett, you know, said, be fearful when others are greedy, be greedy when others are fearful. And uh, so the contrarian would say, would say, boy, when you hear this broad narrative of stay away, you know, you're going to see compression of asset values, which we are seeing. This is exactly, you know, if you believe in the long-term secular trends, which we do, this is actually the time when people should be thinking about how to how to leg into the market. Fantastic. I would like to be more greedy with your time, but uh, we are truly out of time. Thank you so much for all your insights. Over to you, Jeremy, and thank you so much for a fantastic panel tonight. Um, thank you, Lizzie, uh, Arthur, Gary, Michael. That was a bracingly uh, sensible corrective to many of the simplifications about China and its economy that we hear and read about every day. Uh, and thank you for, you know, making an excellent close to the first day of the China Project's Next China Conference. Thanks to our online audience. Uh, shout out to those of you at our live watch parties in New York and DC and in London too. We'll be hosting more live events in the future, so watch this space. Thank you to our sponsors, Hyatt and Global, Dorsey and Whitney, Deloitte, Pillsbury, L. Catterton, Markham Asia, Arcadia Fund Management Group, Kingdom Capital, and Tiffany & Co. Uh, a recording of this conference will be sent to all registrants post-conference. If you want more informed content on China and are not already a subscriber, please check out our subscribe page or get in touch with us. If you have tickets, we will see you tomorrow at our gala dinner in Manhattan. See some of you tomorrow. Thank you and goodbye.